Good morning, everyone. We're going to start uh, uh, a regularly scheduled meeting of the LA County Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission. And um, before we begin, uh, I'd like to uh, tell all the commissioners that we have a new uh, uh, county council assigned to us. Um, our very able uh, county council, Alexandra Zwiderweg, is no longer with us, but she is going to uh, be uh, replaced by Senior Deputy County Counsel Stephen Edwards. Stephen, I don't know if you're on the line uh, yet. I, I am. Good morning. Good morning. Looking Welcome. forward to working with y'all. Thank you so much. We uh, uh, we have many issues ahead of us, Stephen. So we look forward to working with you. We have a full agenda uh, this morning. We're going to uh, continue a prior discussion of street takeovers, and uh, we also have a report on the conditions of confinement in um, in the jails. Um, we're going to hear from our executive director, Ryan Williams, about uh, our new uh, ad hoc committees and changes to uh, our ad hoc committee structure, which is due. You know, those are supposed to change every once in a while. And then at 11 a.m., uh, our new sheriff, uh, Sheriff Luna, is actually going to join this commission, I'm happy to say. We haven't had that in a long time. And with that, I'm going to have Ingrid call the roll so that we can dive in. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Commissioner Bonner? Present. Commissioner Cooper? Commissioner Garcia? Present. Commissioner Giggins? Here. Commissioner Harris? Here. Vice Chair Hicks? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Chair Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Rubin? Yes, here. Okay. Uh, so, just on logistics, if uh, if you want to, if members of the public want to provide verbal comment, um, we're we're up to do that in English or in Spanish. You just have to uh, log in on WebEx or call us via telephone. This commission has a lot of hard hitting debate on the issues. Um, we just ask that everyone be polite to each other. And so uh, the next issue is approval of the consent calendar. Um, uh, we have the December 15th, 22 minutes from our last uh, uh, meeting, as well as, uh, um, well, I think that's it. So uh, can, do we, I'm, Ingrid, I don't know. Do we have to have uh, approval? Okay. Second. Yeah. Sounds like, uh, do we just have unanimous consent here then? I don't see any objection, so it's approved. We ordinarily start with family impact remarks, but we didn't have any requests for family uh, impact remarks today. So we won't have that and we're gonna move on to the reports. I don't have anything special to report because um, our ad hoc uh, uh, chair, Lel Rubin is gonna report on the issues that have been occupying um, many commissioners' times. Uh, but I wanted to offer first uh, uh, our uh, Inspector General, Max Huntsman, if uh, he wanted to report on any ongoing uh, issues or make any remarks. Uh, nothing terribly specific. As you know, we've issued a number of reports recently. Uh, the jail overcrowding problem, which you're going to talk about uh, recently, has been a subject of, of our reporting and uh, investigation. Uh, and I have very uh, severe concerns about it. We recently went down, I personally went down to the jails because of a word that we'd heard that they were going to convert some FIP uh, uh, housing. That's the, the unusual technique they have of employing uh, prisoners to oversee uh, double man high observation housing units, and it's been a very effective unit. They were about to cannibalize one of those units to fill the 
pressure created by IRC and not having enough high observation housing. So I went down to photograph uh, the conditions before they made the change. And, and the word on the street is they've decided not to make the change. So th the battle continues in that regard. Uh, in law enforcement gangs, uh, I, I eagerly await uh, the work that this uh, commission is doing. But in the meantime, we're also preparing for uh, sit down interviews of all the members of the banditos and the executioners to identify them to see whether or not, in fact, those groups are racially and gender stratified. And we have a whole uh, process uh, beginning for that. But like everything in government, it's slow. Uh, so we're working on that, talking to county council about how to make sure that that works effectively uh, to the extent that we need uh, legal backup for it. And uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic that the next phase of getting rid of the gangs will proceed forward. What success we'll have uh, remains to be seen. But I think it's good. it's an effective strategy that I'm hoping will will come to fruition thanks to the work of this commission in no small part in changing the point of view of the sheriff's department with the assistance of the voters. So uh, we, I think we're in a pretty good place in that regard. The sheriff's department has been very cooperative since the change in administration with their oversight uh, legal responsibilities. We have not had any flat out refusals uh, to any of our lawful requests. And that's good news, uh, the, not to say that we haven't had discussions about how can we do this properly and make sure that it, uh, our, our interests in having lawful oversight don't interfere with their functions. But I think uh, we're, we're in a much, much better place. So uh, that's all I have to report, but happy to answer questions at any point during the meeting for anybody who, who has any. Uh, any commissioner questions? Okay. Um... We, uh, this is time for some ad hoc uh, reports. I'm going to begin with the um, ad hoc on uh, deputy gangs or cliques. Um, our chair, Lael Rubin, uh, may have something to report. And then if there are other ad hocs, I hope you'll uh, join in if you want to report as well. Thank you very much, um, Sean, and thank you for your good work. Um, on uh, the issue of deputy gangs and among others. Um, as you all know, this has been an issue that has um, preoccupied this commission and the ad hoc um, for quite some time. Um, and, uh, we've had numbers of special hearings by uh, special counsel Bert Dykesler. Uh, meetings recently and uh, so had an opportunity to the sheriff. Uh, just want to add a, uh, a side comment on the sheriff, the fact that he is coming here um, later this morning is obviously a breath of fresh air. Not had uh, the sheriff talk to this commission and it definitely signifies um, openness of Sheriff Luna and his willingness to work with this commission, which um, I think is extremely long overdue. Um, with that said, it is, um, we are looking forward to um, having special counsel soon um, present a, um, a draft of um, his report and recommendations um, to the full commission, and at that time there will be uh, discussion and input, and of course we will welcome opportunities from other um, groups who were, have been very interested uh, in this subject and, and this issue finally resolved. So um, stay tuned. We look forward to um, finally um, Recommending a policy to the sheriff, um, he will embrace wholeheartedly and begin to move on removing the deputy gangs from the sheriff's department. So we have lots of good things to look for. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Lael. Um, do uh, Rob, you'd like to say something? Yes. I just needed to unmute there. Thanks, Joe. I just thought uh, uh, just a, a bit of history. Uh, the commission hasn't been around that long, but uh, the Civilian Oversight Commission um, 
back in about 2018, I think I was still chair, formed a ad hoc committee for, uh, I think it was initially called deputy clicks slash subgroups, but deputy gangs. And uh, we uh, shortly thereafter, uh, frankly, I think right around the time or shortly after the Kennedy Hall incident, uh, we uh, suggested that the Oversight Commission uh, launch an investigation uh, into uh, deputy cliques slash gangs within the LA County Sheriff's Department. Um, Sheriff McDon then Sheriff McDonald uh, uh, indicated that he was going to um, uh, engage uh, an outside group to investigate uh, the existence of deputy gangs uh, within the Sheriff's Department. And uh, and for that reason, we delayed the oversight commission delayed uh, uh, investigating the matter uh, at that time. Uh, that ultimately led to uh, the engagement of the uh, of the Rand Corporation, a think tank, as we all know, and uh, uh, that took a, quite a bit of time for the Rand uh, for Rand to get, uh, provide a report. Um, they did ultimately require, so it delayed it by about two years, uh, the COC, uh, our oversight investigation uh, into the matter. Um, the RAND report did uh, did confirm the continued existence of, I think they called them deputy cliques or deputy gangs within the Sheriff's Department. It was uh, unfortunately a little short on recommendations that would uh, uh, end uh, deputy gangs slash clicks within the sheriff's department. Um, and uh, so in November of uh, last year, November 2021, after the uh, the RAND study or the RAND report, um, this commission uh, unanimously charged the chair of the commission with engaging pro bono special counsel to investigate and then provide a report and recommendation to this commission. Uh, and I'm gratified that Chair Kennedy actually did put together a uh, pro bono team of special counsel led by a, an outstanding attorney named Bert Dykesler. And uh, it has investigated the matter, including uh, many, many, many interviews of, uh, uh, of uh, current uh, people that are currently employed by the Sheriff's Department, many of whom, by the way, are intimidated uh, and would not, uh, would not testify publicly before the commission. But we also had seven public commission hearings uh, of this commission, uh, special hearings uh, in furtherance of the special counsel's investigation. Um, so special counsel was supposed to report, uh, was supposed to investigate, which he, which they have, and uh, then uh, provide a report and recommendations to this commission. And I just wanted to, that, and, and, and Lael did, uh, Commissioner Rubin did a fine job of indicating that we're, I guess, we're hopeful that we'll have, uh, the special counsel will uh, provide its report and recommendations to this commission uh, uh, soon. Uh, that's yet to be determined, but we're hopeful that that will happen, perhaps even by the end of the month. We, we shall see. Thank you, uh, Chair Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Rob. I uh, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's taken a village to uh, pull off these hearings and the ad hoc uh, um, Committee on Deputy Clicks and Gangs, uh, your your work on this issue is really appreciated. I feel like we're we're getting close to um, the finish line. Uh, of course, then the implementation will be um, a big challenge for us as well. Any other ad hoc reports? Uh, if not, I'm going to. I see Brian Williams has uh, uh, worked out the tech problems and has joined us. And Brian, I'm going to invite you to give the executive director's report. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. My, my tech issues aren't quite worked out yet. I'm on my phone, so I can't quite see you all. Uh, but uh, a couple things. Uh, one, uh, Happy New Year to everyone. We haven't seen everyone since last year. I appreciate everyone who made the drive out to uh, Santa Clarita uh, last year, which was really just a month ago for our informational meeting and uh, where we discussed our priorities. You have two things on your agenda uh, today. One is the meeting schedule, and I wanted to give you an update on that. And then the other one was sort of reflecting back upon our ad hoc committee uh, structure. I sent you an update the other day indicating that uh, we were very close to finalizing a permanent location for our meetings 
Uh, unfortunately, we hit a little hiccup on that. We were trying to get a permanent meeting location of the MTA. Uh, we are still working on that, and I'm hoping to have that resolved in the next week or so. That doesn't stop us, of course, from uh, adopting a meeting schedule, uh, uh, which is, has been uh, traditionally the third uh, Thursday of the month. I think we should continue with that. We're also working toward putting together a combination of virtual in-person slash in-person meetings and ensuring that we have the technology of, available to us and that it is working, unlike this morning, to give us the opportunity to continue to engage the public on a virtual platform. I know that our numbers have increased quite a bit when we uh, uh, at, were at an all virtual platform and allowed additional people to come in. So this will include, of course, moving some of our meetings around uh, to uh, different areas of town, as well as having town halls, perhaps on weekends to make sure that, that folks who aren't able to attend our meetings during the week are able to attend perhaps on the weekends. So I guess a long way of, uh, of putting this, I could have put it a little slightly more succinctly, is that perhaps we adopt this meeting schedule and staff will come back to you again uh, at our next meeting, but certainly give you information if we have it prior to our next meeting as to where our permanent meeting location is going to be as well as perhaps a potential schedule of town hall meetings and uh, weekend meetings so that we can continue to engage the public. Any thoughts, questions on that? Rob? Yeah, uh, I wonder how much sense it makes to schedule all these meetings when we're still unclear as to whether we have a permanent location um, or not. I mean, I think we need to schedule the next couple of meetings just to make sure that we have them on our calendars. But um, it seems to me that uh, most of these meetings will be driven by assuming we can get a permanent location, you know, what day of the week it will be um, and so forth. So I just wonder, I just throw it out as a question to our executive director, uh, whether we should schedule all these and then probably have to reschedule many of them because of uh, uh, the uncertainty of the, uh, the actual physical meeting place. I guess that I guess that that boils down to one of our fundamental questions of whether we're going to meet in person or virtually. Certainly, we can schedule these meetings and they can be held on a virtual platform. But I think you're right; that may change depending upon the schedule availability at MTA or perhaps the other locations that we're looking for. So, if it's the desire of the commission, perhaps we can uh, schedule our next three meetings: February, March, and April meeting on the 16th, 16th, and the 20th. Uh, which gives us, I think, ample opportunity and ample time to determine where our permanent meeting location will be. And if there's any change uh, uh, prior to, of course, those additional two meetings, we can certainly notify the commission and adjust our schedule uh, accordingly. Just two quick points to that. Maybe we should discuss with uh, the, the issue that's been posed. But um, I, my, my view would be that uh, we should have uh, in person hearings, they should have some availability for people that uh, can't attend, but we, the commission itself ought to meet in person and we ought to. Uh, um, we, and I know the executive director is making uh, serious and uh, efforts to get us a permanent meeting place, but we, we do need a permanent meeting place. And let me also say uh, on Saturdays, I prefer not to have commission meetings on Saturdays. We may need to have town halls and that sort of thing on Saturdays, but I. Um, personally, I would prefer uh, to schedule uh, our our monthly hearing, our regular monthly hearing, uh, on weekdays. Thank you, Sean. And Brian. thank you, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, Brian, I just want to say, like, we're six years into this gig, and we're still an itinerant commission. Uh, is there any value <laughs> into speaking to the board of supervisors and? asking like if they could help us secure a location that is permanent and stable and where we could do hybrid meetings where we could meet live and also broadcast to the public because you know in our first couple years these things are natural but this commission's been around a long time and it seems like we we have this struggle every year yes i appreciate that sean you know we weren't itinerant prior to the the uh, pandemic occurring, we had uh, uh, several permanent meeting locations and I will let you know that I've reached out to several offices and several offices have offered to assist us in finding a permanent meeting location. 
We have some backups that aren't optimal, and I'm looking for the optimal meeting place for us, but I'm, I'm pretty certain we're going to have this resolved in the next couple of weeks so that we can re remove our itinerant tag and <laughs> have a permanent, have a permanent uh, uh, location for us, but it's a point well taken. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate it, Brian. I know how hard uh, this particular issue is. Um, is there uh, anything else, Brian, you wanted to cover? Uh, I did just want to briefly talk about the uh, proposed ad hoc committees. Uh, so I just want to make sure in terms of, of the scheduling, going back to the schedule, we're going to keep our dates for the next three months, if that's okay. And if there are any changes, I'll notify the commission and work with you, uh, Chair Kennedy, to make sure we get the word out to both the community and to the commission as to whatever changes might occur. Um, and then in terms of the proposed ad hoc committees, Jennifer, if you can show that slide. I can't quite see that on my phone. Uh, if you recall, at our December meeting, we spent quite a bit of time talking about our ad hoc committees, which really reflect the uh, priorities of the commission itself. We've come back after uh, that meeting and sort of melded together the comments of the various commissioners. We are proposing that we do away with a number of ad hoc committees. Of course, ad hoc committees are designed to be temporary committees, not permanent committees, um, but we've decided to get a rid of a number of the ad hoc committees, and these are, are the proposed ad hoc committees uh, based upon the conversations we had with the commission. The budget, conditions of confinement, deputy gangs, disciplinary process, quality of life, subpoenas, use of force, and technology. Some of these are amalgamations of several of our previous ad hoc committees, um, but we think this covers the priorities that we discussed at our last meeting as well as provides a good organizational framework for us to move forward in terms of the ad hoc committee uh, structure. We have suggested uh, membership on the committees based upon your input at the last meeting. Uh, I sent out a copy of this the other day. I got one or two uh, suggestions as to how these ad hoc committees uh, might be staffed. Um, I got your email, uh, Commissioner Hicks, and we'll make that change, but just wanted to show this to you if there are any, if there are any thoughts or comments or suggestions on this, please let me know. Uh, we don't have to discuss this in a meeting. You can just email me and we'll shoot this out to the various commissioners as well as how these will be staffed. And again, in recognition of the Brown Act, we know that these are temporary commissions and they will be rather temporary committees and they will be activated once an issue pops up concerning these issues. Uh, but we think this is a good organizational framework for the commission. Okay. Any, uh, anyone have any comments? Okay, so we're we're gonna move on. Uh, well, I just want to say we also uh, uh, have on the agenda a <clears throat> LA uh, sheriff's uh, update, but uh, maybe the department wants to do that update through Sheriff Luna when he attends. I don't know, Rob. You have a question? Yeah, you know, just before we leave the uh, executive director's report, I just wanted to. Uh, say, I think we've discussed this before uh, with uh, with Brian, but uh, the civilian, uh, the Citizens Commission on Jail Violence uh, held all of its hearings uh, in, in the Board of Supervisors hearing room uh, for a period of over a year with, uh, with the full support of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I would request that uh, through the chair that we actually request of the Board of Supervisors, not the bureaucrat who runs and schedules the Board of Supervisors hearing room, but the board itself, that it make available to the commission until we can find a permanent home, the Board of Supervisors hearing room for our hearings. And I think that that request will have to come through the chair, but I, uh, but I, would, I will defer to the executive director as to how we make that request, but I formally want to make that request. Thanks. Uh, Brian, any thoughts or should we talk separately about that? I'm happy to make that request. I, I, sure. I, think, the, I think the board should support this um, commission's uh, public meetings. And um, so, Brian, maybe we, you and I can talk about how to do that in the most appropriate manner. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. I think that's a, that's a, a good discussion. We're going to move to some substantive issues. and. Uh, uh, the next one is a continuation of a discussion that began, uh, I think, a, a couple months back regarding um, street takeovers in LA 
We all hear about them. They're in the news. We had um, a great report last time, but many commissioners and myself included felt uh, we didn't understand what was being asked of us. And some of the stuff sounded more um, tailored to um, advocacy before the state legislature. And so our, um, our staff has worked with uh, the group who has um, reported on this and done such good work on this. Uh, and they are back uh, to report some more. And uh, we're really happy to have uh, you back. And Tracy, I think you are the person who is uh, spearheading this uh, for the commission. So I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our speakers and lead a discussion. I'm sure you're going to have uh, questions from the commissioners afterwards. Thank you, Chair Kennedy. Uh, before I proceed, I I'd like to take a moment to show honor and respect to those individuals that have lost their lives because of actions of another person. Thank you. In November, when the street takeover item was on the agenda, our commission discussed the staff report and requested that further consideration be made related to the existence of law enforcement related policies and the modification of the recommendations be made. The report attached to this meeting's agenda has cured the commission's requests and consists of, recommend, of two recommendations for which the LASD has provided a response. In summary, our recommendations and the LASD response includes, one, LASD should develop a street takeover management plan. The LASD response is, LASD is currently evaluating the feasibility of creating a street takeover task force to address the emerging crime and creating a plan. Two, LASD should submit a written quarterly report to the commission on street, street takeover public safety activities. The LASD response is, LASD currently does not have the means to track this unique crime. However, the development of a specific designated statistical code has been proposed. The LASD has advised that they currently do not have a developed and implemented street takeover task force or street takeover policy. LAPD has provided the commission with a copy of their policy, which has been provided via a link to our street takeover task force, excuse me, our street, uh, our street takeover staff report, which is attached to this agenda. And CHP has also advised that they provide assistance to law enforcement agencies related to street takeovers. However, they do not have a specific policy. Today, we have with us subject matter experts from LASD, CHP, and the Street Racing Kills community uh, agency available to speak with us before the commission. First, this morning, we will hear from LASD Traffic Detail S Sergeant Michael Downing. And I'll turn it over to Sergeant Downing at this time for his presentation. Good morning. Good morning. So we still, after the last meeting, we're still in the process of looking at uh, ways to come up with a street racing task force. Um, <clears throat> Our biggest issue with it is the resources for manpower and budgeting. Um, I've proposed two different ways of doing it. One is based upon overtime, which allows us to utilize different um, units for uh, acquiring bodies to work the over time, um, if we look at it for overtime purposes, 
the disadvantage to that is that the deputies right now are currently working uh, mandated overtime at the stations to fill in for patrol vacancies. So, looking at it on a long term scale for overtime, it's possibly not as feasible due to the fact that we won't be able to get bodies to work because they're already maxed out on overtime for their units. If we look at doing it as a regular task force for, I'm recommending a six month pilot project just to get it up and running and see where we can go from there. Um, we're looking at requesting 10 deputies, two sergeants, a lieutenant, um, clerical staffing, to obtain the manpower that we need. Uh, we also need vehicles that come into the budget and then working on a location to have a, like a substation for the deputies to work out of. And I'm also currently in the process of putting together a database to and update our tracking codes so that we can easily look up stats for street racing, street takeovers, uh, incidents related to crashes from takeovers, any arrests from a takeover event or street racing event. If we're able to track, track it, we'd be able to provide better numbers in the long run. Um, so it's still a work in progress. The biggest challenges for us to overcome right now is the manpower in the budget. Any questions? Yes, sir. You know, Sergeant Downey, uh, uh, and I may have missed this, and 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 Tracy may have covered this, so I apologize if it has been covered. But I just wanted your assessment. I mean, how serious is the problem of street takeovers for street racing uh, events uh, in the areas that are policed by the uh, sheriff's department? That is to say, the unincorporated county areas and the contract cities. It, in some areas, it's a nightly occurrence, so it's a huge problem, and it's not just you have to look at it beyond the fact that it's cars blocking the street. So everybody thinks that it's a traffic issue or a traffic enforcement issue. When in reality, when you look at it, they're hitting the same locations every night, and they go out to the same intersections every night. It's become a quality of life issue, just like any other major issue in LA County right now. This is affecting the citizens in unincorporated areas, uh, contract cities. These get the takeovers happen in residential areas. They happen in major intersections for communities near businesses, wherever they want to go. And then the problem with it is that with the way we deal with it now where we may have two deputies respond to an incident. So two patrol cars will go to an incident and all they can do in reality is just push them out to somewhere else. You know, when you send two deputies in or two officers, depending on where you work, um, in to deal with two, three, 400 people, there's nothing we can do. Even when I've done operations in the past where we've had 40 to 50 officers out for a multi agency operation, we're still limited on what we can do due to the sheer volume of people at a takeover. So you have to start looking at it as a quality of life issue. And we got to start looking at it that it's not just a traffic enforcement issue either. So it would so you, have to, so you don't you don't disagree then with the notion that it would be desirable to have let's say a specialized unit or task force that could be called out to address this issue, but your your main concern now that you're looking at is uh, how to uh, how to uh, get the resources to be able to do that. Is that a correct statement, or did I misunderstand you? No, you're correct. It's it all comes down to manpower and resources, and you can't just deal with it on a station level anymore. 
And in the past, when I've done it with multiple agencies, we're able to do a more productive enforcement. We're able to stop the takeovers for the night, or we wind up just pushing them into another city. So these takeover groups are moving from one city to the next all on the same night, or they may even go into the next county, depending on um, where they're at and what their what their plans are for the night for their street takeover stuff. So you would need a county wide uh, task force of, of deputy sheriffs, and and I realize uh, it would be interesting to sort of map out what the budget, what the the numbers would be in terms of re personnel and uh, equipment and uh, necessary for that, but also it would be interesting to know whether or not there's a possibility of reallocating resources within the, that are currently exist within the department to create uh, such a such a countywide task force within the department. And by the way, when we use task force, we're also assuming, you know, task force usually means that we would, we would also have a task, the task force would include local uh, elements of uh, local police or local police officers as well. I, I assume that's what we're talking about. A couple of questions there and then I'll, I'll quit. <laughs> yeah. My vision is to have a county, LA County task force just uh, based with deputies from the Sheriff's Department, yeah. but then work in conjunction with LAPD, the Highway Patrol, and other surrounding agencies, depending on what cities we work in. I've done it in the past. It works great. Um, I have other agencies that are willing to participate, depending on where we go. When we look at budgeting and we talk about numbers for it, so on an overtime basis, if we do it for a year, it's, and I'll just give you approximate numbers, the, for 20 deputies for on overtime for a year, would be close to $3 million. Okay, if we add in the two sergeants, that'd be another 3 million. And then for vehicles and then, um, so I'm looking at 10 patrol cars and then two cars for sergeants we're looking at over close to a million and a half just for cars. And that's just an overtime budget. And if we look at it as a permanent 40 hour work week for the deputies on a straight task force, it drops a little bit because you're not, I mean, it goes up a little bit in price, but just for the deputies, you're looking at close to um, 5 million for a year. Thank you. Anyone else? Leo. Um, yes, I, um, you know, this, this issue, um, is, as we know, more than not demeaning this, but more than quality of life and concern of businesses and, and people having access to their streets when we see, as we have, um, numbers of people um, dying. Most recently, there was a woman in the news who uh, is essentially a homicide victim because of um, being hit by uh, one of these uh, in one of these um, street takeovers. I mean, this it has escalated to the point that um, whatever it takes, I believe the sheriff's department ought to set up something um, to take this issue seriously and um, figure out a way to to deal with it aside from moving. Um, taking two patrol officers and just sort of moving the problem elsewhere. 
I mean, we're, we're talking about lives at risk here. I think whatever it is that the sheriff's department can do um, to uh, try and get a handle on this, I would support. Yeah, to, and I've been doing this for almost 20 years now with street racing and street takeovers. And they're, they're actually two separate groups of car club people. So the, the just a quick back, back background on it, the actual street racing is more of like the fast and the furious kind of guys. And they go out, they race their cars, kind of, so kind of like a drag race and in an area and then they leave. Whereas you have the takeover people that show up and you'll have two, 300 people out there blocking an intersection. And, you know, recently you had the street takeover in LA where they had a Christmas tree bonfire in the middle of the intersection. Um, you know, when you deal with the street racer type people, they've been known to go out and they will melt the street with chemicals or a blowtorch to make their starting point sticky like a drag rate, uh, drag strip. So there's other crimes that have been that are involved in both events. And then when we look at the car crashes that we have at the intersections where bystanders are hit. And in case in point, this last one that LAPD has been dealing with where the one girl was killed, but then you had multiple other people injured that never reported it. And I've dealt with that in the past at Lakewood where a car goes into a crowd, you have video of it, you have injuries, but we can't really do anything about it unless we're, we have victims. And most of the time they don't report it, just like we saw in the LAPD video where people are getting into cars, being transported to wherever, and have never reported it. So the biggest issue when we look at it, when we talk about manpower and the fact that we may only have two or three deputies to deal with it at a station level, even with a task force, with my, if I have 20 deputies, we still don't have enough resources to combat or deal with a takeover of two to 300 people. You know, when we look at the takeovers and that size, now you're looking at almost a, a protest size group or a riot size group if they become combative and uh, violent towards the re responding officers. So there's other things you have to look at other than just the incident at that time. There's a lot to think about on what additional resources would you need if things got violent, uh, how fast can you get those resources to you. The other issues that we have to deal with with the takeovers is that they're constantly moving. So if you watch some of the videos on social media, some of the takeovers last five to 10 minutes. As soon as the officers show up, the guys start leaving and they're just going to the next city or the next intersection or next county. So even when we have some sort of notification of an uh, event going to happen, we may only have an hour or two notice where a takeover is going to occur or a meetup. Most of the time it's five minutes, 10 minutes that we get a notification. Uh, we do work closely with all the other agencies, in, including Riverside County, Orange County, that we all share the same information back and forth because we're all dealing with the same car clubs and same groups. Commissioner Johnson, I believe you're next. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jordan, and uh, thank you, Sergeant, for your uh, presence here today. I just want to raise a question regarding accountability and some of the other issues of accountability involving street takeovers. The case uh, recently at Florence and uh, Crenshaw that resulted in a death 
um, the facts reported on in the case, um, including the recent apprehension of a suspect from Orange County in New Mexico, um, include some troubling evidence of others collusion um, or uh, being accomplices in the blocking of the intersection. And I just want to raise this because it raises some questions of accountability. There was a tow truck, at least one, that was involved in blocking off an intersection. As often happens, large vehicles are used as barriers to, uh, in some places, uh, create buffers so that the takeover can proceed. Well, for those of us who are concerned about chronic misconduct like this and chronic um, danger to both participants and residents, when you have vendors or businesses that operate large vehicles that may then be subject to applying for or securing city or county contracts for towing, for instance, in the case of a tow truck, it raises questions of accountability and tracking that go beyond just the one-off incidents. And I guess I want to ask, are there ways in which information from takeovers can be documented and used for other forms of accountability at the city and county level. Obviously, our ambit here is the county level, but that we should be responsible in gathering so that, for instance, uh, a tow truck operator involved in the street takeover or takeovers is not eligible for county contracting up the road to do county business on behalf of the people of Los Angeles. I think we need to look at far the other forms of accountability that we can bring to this that go beyond the uh, initial danger and the immediate harm to residents and participants. You know, and I don't know the circumstances on the or the tow about the tow truck in the last one. Um, Cause it may not have been a big company. It may have been you know, a repo kind of guy that goes out and does stuff. So it may not have been an independent tow truck, but you're right. So you, we do the, what we can for tracking um, data. Like I said, we share information back and forth between the counties and agencies, you know, but it also falls upon the actual city responsibility too. What can they, the cities do to change the intersections a little bit. So like Compton uh, last year, try putting in the bot stocks at the intersections, kind of make the road a little bit bumpier, hoping that would prevent takeovers. Um, and unfortunately the bot stocks really didn't work. They were still going out and doing donuts at those intersections and going up over the bot stocks. But at least Compton's looking at ways of trying you know, the other thing cities could do is put in um, surveillance cameras or video cameras in major intersections that we can uh, view live from our dispatch areas and see what cars are getting there. You know, if we can read license plates and work at different ways of recording incidents so we can do follow up later. Um, so there's a lot of things that everybody, it's a problem that everybody needs to pitch in and help out on, including the cities and, uh, county that what can we do to change the intersections to try and make them less appealing to go out and do, or the roadways that are in commercial areas. So for example, in uh, the city of commerce, they had a street race fatality and it's been approximately say 10 years ago uh when i was a detective that they had three people killed on a in a commercial area side street where after the fact uh, the city of commerce went in and put in the speed humps in every so many feet down the roadway yeah, they're annoying to drive over if you're a regular car in the semi trucks, but it broke up the long stretch of street where the street racers can no longer go out there and race. It, 
they still go out there and do side shows once in a while because I've gone out and I've seen this you know, tire marks left over and it, you know, but it's not as bad as it used to be in that area. So there are ways that the city can get involved in changing the roadway design, but it, again, it takes a lot of money for the city to do that, and they have to look at their funding what's in what's a priority. Thank you. We have a question from our inspector general, Max Huntsman. I wanted to advise the commission, since you're considering giving uh, advice yourself to LSD or possibly the board regarding the legality of one of the options that was stated by uh, the sergeant. Uh, as Judge Bonner pointed out, the allocation of budgeted resources in order to target a particular crime, particularly an organized crime such as this, is an appropriate uh, uh, in, appropriately in the discretion of the sheriff. And so the uh, sheriff's department could use a portion of its multi-billion dollar budget to uh, put together a task force as described and bring people in from other uh, areas. Another option suggested by Sar the sergeant would be to petition the board for additional uh, increases to the budget to allow uh, more staff to be brought in to work this problem in addition to the current budget. Uh, given COVID, that's a, a difficult ask. Uh, as we all know, the budgets that we currently have for the county are below what people need to run run their departments, and that's certainly true for the sheriff's department, uh, which is uh, facing shortfalls regarding the staffing. But the option that was suggested of overtime is not a lawful option. For the past four years, the sheriff's department has ignored its budget, uh, which is unlawful uh, under the uh, penal code, and instead uh, simply used overtime to staff the amount that it thinks it would like, independent of the democratic process for establishing budgets. And that was a subject of um, great uh, concern by, by the board under the previous sheriff who did not consult with county council. The current sheriff now is consulting with county council and facing uh, a serious budget shortfall, which includes uh, the, a great amount of overspending because of that overtime. That's unlawful. And this sheriff is going to get a pass right now because he's new, he inherited this, but in time, he's gonna to have to deal with the problem that if he continues to spend using overtime beyond the amount that the democratic process has assigned uh, to law enforcement, that that's not lawful. So um, I, I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the commission so that you didn't advise the use of overtime as a tool for addressing this problem. The other two options are lawful, the one of, of reassigning resources that Judge Bonner suggested, or the one uh, that the sergeant suggested, which is asking the board for more resources. Yeah, if I can clarify that real quick on the overtime issue. Uh, it's not necessarily the department paying a overtime to fill spots for street racing. It's overtime on the deputy's hours. So if I work a 40 hour work week, and I want to go out and the city is, let's say, is one that I did in the past. The city of Paramount wants to pay city, use city funds to pay deputies to come out and work. So it's overtime for the deputy because he's doing more than his 40 hour work. week. Or like when we do our office of traffic safety grant operations, it's we're paid overtime because we've not gone above our 40 hour work. I, I it's understand not using point, county okay. funding. It's using grant funding. Well, if you, if you can pay for it with external sources that are grant funded and not from the budget, but currently the LSD budget is, I think something like $500 million over because of overtime spending. Yeah. So unfortunately, when you get a dollar over budget, then overtime spending is unlawful, unless, as you say, it is 100% coming from a grant source. So if you have a grant source for overtime, that's a separate issue. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about for our overtime is a separate funding, not from department funding. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'd like to thank Sergeant Downing. Oh, there's and, one more uh, question. Okay, I'm sorry, we have another question. Uh, yes, Commissioner Harris. Thank you. I just want to um, piggyback on what Commissioner Johnson started on, uh, but from a little different angle, and that is the issue of accountability. 
I am not so naive as to believe that there is an easy fix for this problem. I am also not so naive to believe that this is caused by necessarily external uh, actions of others. However, I do think it needs to be voiced that I believe it would be beneficial perhaps for law enforcement nation nationwide to have some conversation with motor vehicle manufacturers and the method in which they advertise so frequently shows in vehicles engaged in street racing, um, unlawful activity, glorifying this type of conduct. Now, I can't say scientifically how much that adds to people's desire to engage in this type of activity, but I also think most of us recognize that if you are constantly bombarded with these images, it probably plays some role in your thought process. And I will throw in there the motion picture industry also. Um, so I, I just think it needs to be voiced that there's a lot of accountability here that needs to be um, acknowledged. And I think that not all of the players are at the table and perhaps law enforcement at least could have some discussion with the motor vehicle manufacturers and even the motion picture industry that maybe we might want to have another look at this issue from their perspective, that maybe they could do a little something to help. I don't believe that's going to solve the problem, but I also think it might it might at least start a conversation where there is some acknowledgement that this could be playing some role. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Commissioner Bonner. Do you have another question? It, it, it is a question for Sergeant Downey. Uh, you know, when we're presented a problem of this sort, I know part of it is to get law enforcement engaged in it, but I'm wondering, um, you know, are how many, I, this is hard to quantify with, without, dat, without a, a data set in a field, but I'm just wondering uh, notionally how many people get arrested behind this activity of uh, street takeovers and or street racing uh, events. Um, is, uh, and we're talking quality of life issues here, uh, is it a felony under the penal code to, uh, uh, let's say, block off a street for street racing, or uh, is it still a, a misdemeanor? Uh, I mean, I'm just wondering, in term, does, the de does the district attorney, when people are arrested, uh, vigorously prosecute these cases? Uh, or are there any cases, just because you can't make arrest? I mean, this is this kind of gets into the resources issue, but talk that out because look if the if the penalties are are not that great you're you're never going to deter the conduct i mean and if there are no prosecutions or the prosecutions result in you know a slap on the wrist uh it's not going to have any impact on uh, on the problem so talk that out a little bit with me if you would again it depends on how you deal with each situation so like for regular Let's just say regular street racing where they're drag racing each other and not necessarily the whole group out there watching it. If you catch the cars racing, you can impound the vehicle for 30 days and then it's a misdemeanor arrest for the driver or the person starting the race if you catch them. Most of these are all misdemeanor arrests, unless there's somebody um, significantly injured or killed, then it becomes a felony. And even with, depending on the circumstances, if somebody's killed, if they have prior knowledge of the dangers of street racing or the street takeover, then the district attorney or city attorneys can file a murder charge against them versus vehicular manslaughter. When we respond to, say, a street takeover, again, depending on your manpower and resources for the night, there's several ways to look at handling it. So my past operations where I've had, you know, 20 to 30 officers out, and that's 20 to 30 vehicles, and working with CHP and LAPD, 
we've been able to detain upwards of 70 to 100 cars for blocking the roadway. And then we uh, tow all the vehicles for blocking the roadway. And then if we issue citations for the bystanders, those are infractions. Um, and again, if we're able to catch the guy that's doing the sideshow or stunts, then again, it's just a misdemeanor arrest plus the vehicle impound. So the way we look at it when you detain the bystanders or impound cars for blocking the roadway, that's going towards the spectator. And the hope there is that by going after the spectators more than just the takeover, there's the stunt guy. If we take away their crowd, why are they going to come out if there's nobody to watch? Think of it just like the sporting events during COVID. You had a football team playing football and nobody in the stadium. So it's the same kind of concept. If you take away the people that are coming out to watch, there's no more thrill in going out and doing the sideshow. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Downing. Uh, at this time, we will hear from CHP. We have with us CHP officer Rodrigo Jimenez and officer Joseph Davia. <laughs> Trying to get in here. All right. Yeah. Good morning. Um, yeah. Thanks for uh, for you guys having us here. Um, and yeah, we just would like to go over yeah the, this topic here. Uh, it's street racing for the longest time has been an issue. Uh, you think back, you can see they've had street racing in movies as, such as Greece. If you want to go um, just off of like the media and everything, but uh, the the way the culture has changed over the years that's that's the thing that's changed uh when they go into these um takeovers so that's where you're starting to get a big group of people and when the participants are using these vehicles they're pretty much using them as they're they're a deadly weapon and uh in a way right um these are over three thousand pound vehicles and they're being swung around and unfortunately, people are getting hurt and uh, even killed in, in these events. So the CHP, we do take it seriously. We um, we actually have a street racing task force that we do have. And uh, we we go with operations uh, like the sergeant said he's he's been involved with. Um, and uh, so that's something that we have been uh, participating in. I've actually participated in some of these operations myself. We've uh, impounded um, a lot of these, a lot of vehicles, but the way technology is, uh, all it is is a little post, and they, the people, the participants, they just go to another, another venue. So, um, we've also worked with some nonprofit organizations like Street Racing Kills and uh, Motor Gospel Ministries to help get the word out there to show how dangerous these events can be. Um, we also like to advocate uh, where there's legal ways to have these participants who want to test the performance of their vehicles. So we have venues that we, we'd like to tell them to go to, such as Irwindale Speedway, uh, this is Auto Club in Fontana, Willow Springs, which if they want to go out and test the performance of their vehicles, they can and do it in a legal and safer matter. It's not going to be completely safe, but it's a way they can do it in a safe environment so to speak um every thursday night irwindale speedway has their drag strip open where they can go out and race they also have their burnout box where if they want to participate in the sideshow type activities they can do it again in a safer manner um so with that, if we have any questions for, particularly for us.
Okay, we'd like to thank uh, you officers uh, Jimenez and Davia. Uh, at this point, we will turn to uh, executive director from Street Racing Kills. We have with us Lily Trujillo. Hello, everyone. Hi, Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo from the California Highway Patrol Street Racing Task Force over there. Um, and Joseph, pleasure meeting you now in person. Uh, Definitely, guys, we are trying to do what we can. We have collaborated um, here with Street Racing Kills, with the Street Racing Task Forces, the California Highway Patrol, and the Los Angeles uh, Street Racing Task Force as well. Um, one of the things, of course, that we focus with Street Racing Kills in education and preventing the problem from happening all together from the beginning, from scratch. So, going to the schools, uh, we have been doing it, we're still doing it. We have uh, it used to be really hard to get in, but as you guys know, as the problem has grown so much that actually the schools are welcoming uh, us coming in uh, and bringing all the resources that we can. Uh, at the schools, uh, we have a great presentation called The Fast and Fatal, uh, where we cover all the aspects from the takeovers, from the street racing. We always bring uh, California Highway Patrol Street Racing Task Force uh, public information officer to come and help us or the Los Angeles Police Department. So we always have someone that comes and helps us mentor the students before they get out there, uh, preventing them from going to the takeovers all together for the most street racing, the dangers of it. Um, we collaborate also at a higher level uh, and um, the courts now referring us these individuals that are uh, being caught while they're spectating, um, that's a form of diversion that we have, so we get to talk to them. We get to see also the age group and some stats that, that we need. Uh, and yes, it is from 17 to 25. I think we see everything. Of course, we see older as well, but mostly we get to see and uh, talk to these individuals uh, um, and see where they're coming from, why they're doing this. And as the California, California Highway Patrol was stating, uh, yes, uh, there is places where they can go, and we tell them about places where they can go uh, to do these uh, tracks that are available. Uh, unfortunately, there is not that many tracks, and some of them have been closed. So that's, I think, one of the things that they are complaining about themselves, saying, well, it's too far. Um, I don't want to go all the way over there, or I'll go there once in a while. So I think uh, education is important, and the collaboration uh with the street racing task force is important. Um, I personally have been when they're being trained and uh, yes, as uh, Sergeant Downey was saying, it is a, a, a huge effort and it is, uh, for what I've seen, uh, they're being prepared to go to a situation that is a little scary. I think even for my, uh, as just as a, the public, me being there, I've been stuck at one and I've seen how how scary it is just being stuck at one and you're in all the way in the back and you don't know what's going on. And then you see these people being arrested. Uh, then you jump on the freeway and they're going to the next location. They're flying right next to you. They could even be racing to get to the next location. So um, I think the education is one of the most important things that, that, that should be done. Uh, more venues uh, where they can go. But unfortunately, I know that uh, most cities uh, do not uh, want to allow a track to be built. They're actually co closing them, which means uh, these people, uh, this that's what they're saying, well, 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 we don't have a place to go, or we, we go there but once in a while. So I think education is very, very important and the collaboration that we're still doing with, uh, uh, with the police department, the California Highway Patrol. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Lily Trujillo? Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Uh, at this time, I had one question. question. Oh, okay. Uh, Commissioner Bonner. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I, I realize education could be valuable and perhaps uh, trying to do something about the glorification of street racing and the movies and the media, well, although probably an impossible goal. Uh, for a lot of reasons, but I'm wondering whether we shouldn't be rethinking or thinking about consequences for the conduct here. And uh, in that regard, kind of two things that we might consider recommending, uh, but 
this is not for the sheriff, this is really for the legislature, but one would be for people that are caught and arrested for organizing or facilitating a street takeover and the like, uh, you know, elevating that, that, that to a felony crime uh, so it could be prosecuted as a felony. Uh, again, if this is a quality of life issue, we should be thinking in terms of making the consequences more severe. And I think it is a quality of life issue for people that have to endure the situation and because of the risk involved. And secondly, uh, you know, it is it is inconvenient to impound a car, but we might consider legislation, I, I just throw this out, of not just impounding, but forfeiting vehicles that are uh, used to block streets for purposes of uh, street racing and uh, or uh, that are, are racing in the streets. I mean, that, that there would be a forfeiture potential. You just, you lose your car if you do that. I'm wondering what you would think about those kinds of consequences uh, or whether you've thought about them at all, Ms. Trujillo. Uh, definitely. Uh, right now, we are actually working with different legislators and one, one of them right now uh, with uh, Tsuchi, that's exactly what he wants to do, what you just mentioned right now. So it is uh, in the works of uh, creating uh, that bill. Thank you. Okay, uh, and if we have one of our other subject matter experts that uh, have any uh, opinion on that, uh, one of the questions from Commissioner Bonner. Just say that I uh, know the LAPD is looking at bringing back the forfeiture of cars and um, trying to get it passed where not only do the forfeiture, but go back to um, seizing the cars and destroying them like they used to do. Yeah, it was probably about 20 years ago when they used to uh, impound cars and then crush them for the street racing. So it, it was an option that they're trying to bring back. Um, it is effective because you want to take your, you know, 80 to a hundred thousand dollar car out for a night and then have it not only impounded, but then have the court determine it's a hazard or whatever and ordered it destroyed. So is it worth losing a hundred thousand a car for one night of racing? Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'd like to thank all of our subject matter experts. Uh, we would like to thank the commission and the public for your time related to this important issue. Uh, we would also at this time submit to the commission on this issue. Thank you. Well, we, we, uh, the agenda says, uh, time for commissioner comments. And then I guess, uh, we need to take public comments. Um, I'd like to start by just asking the sergeant, um, in our report, the staff talks about, uh, how the LA police department has a notice, um, 8.1 street takeover best practices. Does the LA Sheriff's Department have a similar, um, I guess, uh, a written document of, rest, of best practices for investigating uh, or dealing with street takeovers like the LAPD? We are currently in the process of completing our best practice training video that is, um, being put out by our emergency vehicle operations center and our training bureau. And then we'll have a written field ops directive on best practices. And it's gonna be pretty simple that the biggest issues we've had in the past is when a deputy decides to go into a street takeover by himself and then the crowd will swarm the patrol car. We've had deputies that have had rocks and bottles thrown at them. Um, patrol cars have been hit by fleeing spectators or fleeing sideshow cars. Um, so we're looking at trying to redu reduce those incidents because then when that happens, now you're looking at an emergency response from other stations or the handling station. And it can turn into 
a use of force and major issues as the event progresses. So our best practice is to have at least two or three patrol cars respond to a takeover and unfortunately just push them out um, and break it up. And by doing it that way with at least two to three cars, we try and get them to leave the area safely so we don't have vehicle crashes when we don't have the pedestrians um, or bystanders getting hit. So it's in the works. It should be done within the next week or two. Okay. Have you, though, consulted with the, I mean, I know you have like a healthy or friendly rivalry with the LAPD, but have you consulted with the LAPD best practices uh, document? Because it sounds like a lot of time and energy went into crafting that. Yes, their training bureau looked it out, went over it. Uh, like I said, I've, when we have our meetings with the other agencies and the other counties, we talk a lot about what's the best, best practice, what's the current trend, you know, what works for one agency, what doesn't work, and then we come up with our best practices based upon that. Thank you. Anyone else? JP. Yeah, I would like to suggest that perhaps it would be worthwhile for this commission to ask staff to do some research on the possibility of joining with LAPD or other jurisdictions in uh, supporting legislation to do precisely what was just suggested, that vehicles that are involved in these type of activities be not only impounded but destroyed, because I have to wholeheartedly agree. You're only going to have to crush one or two of those cars in the world will get out. Boy, you don't want to be doing this stuff. This is going to cost you some serious money. That's even better than making a felony, in my estimation. You hit them in the pocketbook in a real way, because there's nothing they want. They're only doing this to show off their wonderful cars. So if all of a sudden their cars are getting yanked out from underneath them and crushed in a very public way, I don't think it'll take too many of those before the word gets out that maybe this conduct is just not worth it. So I'd like to suggest this commission that we have staff um, look into that possibility and uh, coordinating, coordinating with other jurisdictions and perhaps press for legislation to allow for that to, in fact, happen. Certainly look at that. Um. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Lily, you wanted to weigh in. Yes, it's. Uh, I just wanted to say that. Uh, yes, exactly. That's exactly what uh, the it's being worked on. What you're talking about, right now is literally we're working exactly on that with uh, Los Angeles Police Department. Tracy, is there anything uh, uh, you're asking this commission to do right now? I don't think that the report before us has anything about. Uh, legislative advocacy, uh, nor do I know if that's our forte, uh, but is there anything right now that we're being asked to do? Uh, we're asking uh, the commission to receive the report and uh, file the report and or to adopt the report. Okay. So is that a motions process or? I would make a motion, uh, Mr. Chair, that we uh, receive the report and we adopt the second recommendation, which is to request quarterly a quarterly report from the Sheriff's Department with respect to street racing and street uh, takeover events. I realize they don't have one on their database, but I think uh, nonetheless, there's a way of trying to make a report that, you know, as to how, ma how many uh, events have taken place in that category, where they've taken place to the extent known by the Sheriff's Department within its jurisdiction. So I think we ought to get quarterly reports so we can continue to monitor this issue. I'm a little reluctant on rec recommendation number one at this point, not that it's a bad recommendation, it's just that I think the Sheriff's Department ought to be given some additional time to think through the resources issue before we you know, before we recommend to the sheriff a, a task force or some specific uh, organizational mechanism to deal with the problem. So that would be, I, I, that's a kind of a wordy motion, that, but that would be my motion based upon the report that's been made by staff, the excellent report, by the way, that was made by staff on this issue. Second. 
Okay, there's a second as to adopt the second recommendation only of reporting. So, uh, uh, can we um, have a vote? We'll need to have public comment, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I, you would think by now I would get it. Okay. Um, let's do the public comment before we actually have a vote on uh, uh, Rob's motion. Thank you. And as a reminder, if you are a attendee who would like to provide public comment, please raise your hand in the participant window. Uh, once you raise your hand, that will put you in queue and we will go through to uh, accept your public comment. Everyone will receive 2 minutes. So please raise your hand if you have not already. Thank you. And the 1st public comment will come from D Garcia. I've sent you the request to unmute, so please go ahead and acknowledge that. Okay, and please begin when you're ready. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? You do. Hi, my name's Dee Garcia, and I'm in. Lo I live in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm an educator, and I'm also a law student at Southwestern Law School. And I just wanted to leave a public comment and say that. It's uh, really disturbing to hear felony murder being thrown around so casually as a solution to something that uh, it seems like nobody has a solution for. And that's my public comment. Thank you. And the next comment will, will Brown. Sorry, Will Brown. A request has been sent for you to unmute. Okay, please go ahead, Bill. Yes, I had a couple questions for the commission. Uh, first, regarding uh, these issues, I was wondering if the new sheriff has indicated either to the commission or anybody else um, his analysis and approach uh, to this street racing takeover issue. Uh, and the level of priority, has he indicated a level of priority? In his response to this, again, street reading takeover issue, um, thinking specifically about if he's considering reallocating resources, um, you know, at what level is he thinking about the reallocation of resources? So that was one question I had. And then the second question is just more broadly with the new sheriff. Uh, can the commission share with us the public? Uh, the new, any kind of new relationship that exists between the commission and the sheriff, has there been communication? Um, has there been discussion of the ongoing issues uh, with his, his, he's inherited in his department, including deputy gangs and including Men's Central's jail and what to do with it? And I was wondering if the commission can provide any update on their relationship to the new sheriff and what kind of communication has occurred between the sheriff and the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next comment will come from Adriana Quinones. So request has been sent to unmute. Jennifer, can I make the announcement? Oh, yes. Or... I'm sorry. Please go ahead, Ingrid. Yes, please. Yes. Um, My name is... Hi, can you hear me? Yes, but hold tight. Just one moment, Adriana. Uh, sure. We are going to have an announcement in Spanish. Sorry about the confusion. No problem. Please go ahead, Ingrid. Buenos días. Si necesitan traducción a sus comentarios de inglés a español, simplemente digan la palabra español antes de empezar y alguien le dirá cómo proceder. Gracias. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, okay, Adriana, please begin now. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Adriana Quiñones. Um, I'm a resident of Hacienda Heights. I'm a community advocate. Um, what I would like to see the commission do is actually have more community outreach. Um, go to the different areas. I live in the San Gabriel Valley, and I would definitely like to see the commission have like a town hall, kind of tell the community what your purpose is, and also get feedback from the community. Um, I work very closely with law enforcement uh, through organizing my community with Neighborhood Watch and um, address concerns that our community has. But I think the new sheriff also needs to have town hall meetings to hear from us. Um, but uh, definitely a lot of people don't know about this commission and its purpose. So I think it's important that you do that 
And I think we need to stop playing games, um, you know, fighting with law enforcement, with uh, Board of Supervisors. I would like to see more partnership because at, at the end of the day, everybody's there to service our community. And uh, working in partnership, we will get a lot of things accomplished rather than fighting each other. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. And uh, the last public comment will come from Steve Hill. If you are an attendee and you have not yet um, been called, but you would like to provide public comment, please do raise your hand or send a chat to the host. Uh, but Steve Hill, you are unmuted. Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We do. Okay, great. Uh, first off, I have a question about the CLC itself. What is your stated purpose for your existence? And do you have additional public comments yes. that you would yes. like to provide? Yes. Okay. yes, I do. I was arrested back on March 7th of 2022 uh, by the DLJ at the request of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And now there seems to be a dispute about my arrest and I can't get any answers. I've asked my state senator and uh, he's going to be uh, getting the attorney general involved. But I've, I've been begging and asking for assistance from this commission for, I believe, over two years. Um, at this point. And sorry, Steve, I, I just wanted to jump in right now. We're at public comment related to street takeovers. We will take general public comment later. Do you have any additional um, public comments specifically related to street takeovers? Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait for general then comments. Thank you. Okay, no problem. And we do have 2 additional people who raised their hand. Melissa Camacho, you should be receiving a request to unmute right now. Okay, and Joe. when you are ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Melissa Camacho of the ACLU Southern California. Uh, I'm making comment today because I'm a little concerned with the street takeover task force. The commission has been concerned with the existence of deputy gangs in the sheriff's department, and we'll soon be moving on to discuss the really deplorable conditions in the jails, and yet. Under the focus here for street takeovers is how to increase resources to the sheriff's department to essentially make a whole lot more arrests. Um, there, there's no place to put people. <laughs> the jails are already operating 20% above capacity and many, many more people are dying in the jails than they are on street takeovers. So obviously it's an area of concern, you know, people in the community want to be safe, but as far as, you know, the commission's oversight of the sheriff's department, it seems like the focus should be on protecting the people who are already within the sheriff's custody and making sure that resources are being spent um, in a way that isn't going to prop up the power of deputy gangs or ignore the, um, I guess the, the real resource problem uh, within the jails and especially to focus on reducing the overcrowding and getting people out of there. Thanks very much. Thank you. And uh, the last person who has raised their hand to comment on street takeovers is T. You have been sent a request to unmute. Okay, please go ahead when you are ready, T. The jail section and as well as general public comment, please. Okay, so nothing on street takeovers then? No. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to you at that time. Uh, Chair Kennedy, that does conclude all of the public comments related to street takeovers. Okay, well, I think uh, then we can uh, vote on this proposal, which is really about having the LS LASD uh, uh, report back on their efforts to, I guess, um, create best practices and what's going on in terms of implementation uh, uh, about street takeovers, not felony murder or um, more resources for um, the task force. Those were discussions, but I don't think that's actually what the commission is moving for. So let's have a vote on that. Commissioner Bonner. Aye. 
Commissioner Cooper. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Giggins. Aye. Commissioner Harris. Aye. Vice Chair Hicks. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Chair Kennedy. Yes. Commissioner Rubin. Yes. And motion carries. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, to our presenters on that issue. You've come here twice and I, I really uh, appreciate it. At this time, I think uh, we are scheduled to uh, uh, take a 15 minute break. So it's uh, 1032 and uh, I guess we'll come back at uh, 1047.
Okay, we have about 1 minute left for our break. Uh, if you are a commissioner in front of your computer, please turn your video on. So we'll know when everyone is back. And if you are an attendee who would like to provide general public comment, please raise your hand now or send a chat to the host to confirm that you are in queue. Thank you. Okay, it's um, it's ten forty eight. So maybe we should get started. We um, we had some people who wanted to make co public comments that weren't related to um, the street racing issue, and um, we have Sheriff Luna coming uh, at eleven, and uh, I think it's important for him to hear the next report from uh, various stakeholders about um, the situation with the jails. And so we were gonna see if people wanted to give some public comment right now before we hear from uh, various people from the, uh, either within the custody, um, I think we have uh, correctional health services and two commissioners from the civil brand commission. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and get started with the general public comment. We have three people who have raised their hands so far. So Steve, we'll get started with you. Steve Hill, you have two minutes on the clock. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. And my apologies for, for uh, wasting time and speaking earlier. Um, listen, um, I would really like for the Civilian Oversight Commission to 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 step in and take a look at my case and what I've gone through uh, just just in the last approximately three years. I, I, won't, I won't even go back as far as when the sheriff came to my house and shot and killed my dog in my driveway. Uh, just what I've been through in the last three years. Now, I was arrested on March 7th, 2022 by DOJ officers who stated to me at the time it was at the request of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department no one can find any paperwork about my arrest pertaining to my arrest. I have I have not been provided with what I'm being arrested about. No, no one has given me anything in, with specifics about my arrest. Uh, they they someone is still in possession of my uh, father's guns who was a World War II veteran and a hunting buddy of mine before his death. Uh, they still have my pistol. And the, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department states that it wasn't them. And the DOJ states that everything started in the Sheriff's Department. Um, <laughs> this is really comical, but it's my life and it's my life has pretty much been ruined until I can uh, reclaim my name. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, a retired peace officer and a businessman. I'm also an activist. And I do believe I was arrested because I spoke out at a meeting about cannabis in Leona Valley that County Supervisor Visor, Captain Barger had. If someone could please help me, it would be highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. 
Uh, next, we will hear from T. You've been sent a request to unmute. Please go ahead when you're ready, T. Okay, uh, good day. Can you hear me? We do. So, too many people are dying in LA County jails from record breaking deaths. A week in two, um, 2021, the numbers from 2022 uh, decreased slightly, but even though we're not even three weeks into 2023, two people have already died in custody. Um, I'm glad to see the Sheriff's Department complying with the new law requires them to post in custody death information within 10 days. The COC should provide a link to the LSD um, page on its website to help members of the public find the vital information. Um, while the new law only requires LASD to post the information going forward, the COC should ask LS LASD to post the information going back at least two years or more because it's been decades um, that the public knows what happened in 21, 22. Um, and I'll raise the name of Jelani Lovett. Um, and then prior, I'll also raise the name of John Horton, who was killed in custody over 13 years ago now or just about 13 years and still his mother helen jones has not received any type of accountability um they said that man he was beaten to death by the 3000 boys and they said his death was um suicide and then they later deferred it to deferred it because he was beaten so badly everybody could tell that he was murdered in that jail by the deputies and i'll go on to say while well, the overall number of deaths decreased slightly in 22 it was horrific recent record breaking year for homicides. The public only knows information through third quarter, um, thanks to the OIG quarterly reports, but even in those three reports, four people died by homicide. In September, one of those individuals was killed uh, by a cellmate, Twin Towers in May, someone at MJ, MCJ was found um, lying in a pool of blood. It's not clear from the OIG report um, where and when yeah. the homicides occurred, there's more reasons for LSD to put in custody death information for 2022 and 2021 on the web page. Does include your time, Keith. Okay, thank you. Uh, and as a reminder, if you're an attendee and you would like to provide public comment, please raise your hand in the participant window or send a chat to the host and we will make sure that you are in queue. Uh, it looks like we have Vanessa Perez as next and Vanessa, it looks like right now you are the last person for general public comment unless someone else raises their hand. So, Vanessa, a request has been sent for you to unmute and please go ahead when you are ready. Vanessa, it looks like you are unmuted, but we don't hear you. Vanessa, are you there? I'm sending the request to unmute you again. And Vanessa, we are still not hearing you. I'll chat with you offline. Uh, maybe there's an issue with your microphone, but I apologize. We do not hear you. And Chair Kennedy, it looks like that does conclude our public comments for general public comment. Okay. So, uh, having heard from the public, I think we should move into our, uh, at least starting our next topic. I, I believe the sheriff will join us in just a few minutes. Uh, but we're going to now take up the matter of the LA County Sheriff's Department jails and conditions of confinement. Uh, during our November 17th, 2022 meeting, uh, we heard discussions of the conditions of confinement in the jails, and uh, we heard from various subject matter experts, and uh, we're going to now hear more about that, uh, kind of the follow-up to our last meeting. And um, Tracy, you're going to lead this discussion, I believe, so I'm going to turn it over to you. If, if I may, Mr. Chair, it looks like uh, Sheriff Luna is now logged on. Oh, thank you. Um, Do we want to have the, does the sheriff, would he like to make any remarks before we begin our uh, last agenda item on the jails? 
And so Sheriff Robert Luna, it looks like you are logged on and unmuted now. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, good morning uh, to all of you and uh, thank you for allowing me to be on here with all of you. Uh, Lisi, I, I actually see a lot of familiar faces and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to presenting everything I have, uh, probably not at this time when it's my turn, but uh, Assistant Sheriff uh, Sergio uh, will be on and, and he'll be addressing you guys. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, nice to have you here, uh, Sheriff, participating in this meeting. We, um, we really appreciate it. I think it's appropriate, but we also really appreciate your engagement with the commission and the public on issues of importance to them. Yeah, you may see so much of me at one point. You may ask me to stop coming on board. I I I don't think that's a that's a problem. We welcome. <laughs> so Tracy, you want to uh, uh, go back to uh, our discussion of the jails? Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Kennedy. Uh, I'd like to take a moment of silence out of respect for individuals that have lost their lives in confinement first. Thank you. Uh, in November, when the conditions of confinement item was on the agenda, our commission heard from various subject matter experts and questioned the experts related to areas that included, but were not limited to, overcrowding and inmate reception center processing delays, COVID-19 and MPOX in jails, pregnant people in jails, and in custody deaths. The report attached to this meeting's agenda has cured the commission's requests and consists of three recommendations for which the LASD has provided a response. In summary, our recommendations and LASD's response includes request that LASD collaborate with Correctional Health Services in the development of written quarterly reports on LASD's conditions of confinement and publish them on LASD's website. LASD's response. LASD collects such information and it can be included in the proposed report. Request number two, request that LASD publish on the LASD website an annual in custody deaths report in accordance with Assembly Bill 2761. LASD's response. LASD has created the mechanism to track and post the AB 2761 information on the department's public website, and it is currently being posted. Request number three, request LASD publish an annual homicide investigations report on LASD's public website. LASD's response, LASD agreed that such report can be prepared. The LASD and Correctional Health Services have provided additional responses to the Commission's line of questions that have been linked to the staff report that is available to the attached agenda. Today, we have with us subject matter experts from LASD, Correctional Health Services, and the Civil Brand Commission available to speak before the Commission. First, we will hear from the LASD Assistant Sheriff Sergio Aloma and LASD Commander Hugo Macias. I will turn to both LASD experts. Good morning. Uh, this is Assistant Sheriff Sergio Aloma. Uh, can everyone hear me? We do. Thank you for having me on this morning and uh, to discuss uh, conditions of confinement in our jails and uh, what we're we're doing moving forward. Uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier, and, and I don't know if you just want me to answer, answer questions, uh, I'm certainly prepared to speak to uh, the issues that have been brought up and were presented to the department related to overcrowding in the jails. As was mentioned uh, just a bit ago uh, by Ms. Jordan, uh, we are complying with AB 2761. Uh, our, um, in custody death statistics are available on at lasd.org on our website uh, in compliance with uh, 2761. We are also working uh, to uh, uh, 
uh, ensure that we're in compliance with um, any reports that were requested by the commission commission moving forward so that that's also uh, published as well. Um, uh, I'm also prepared to speak to um, our current conditions of confinement and what we are doing to uh, ease overcrowding in our population here in our uh, county jail system. So uh, I can certainly start and, and uh, let you know what we have been doing and what we are doing. Um, if you'd like to hear that, um, I don't know if you want to ask uh, additional questions at this point, or, or would you like me to speak to our, our strategies related to uh, overcrowding? If you can speak to the overcrowding strategy. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as we know, uh, historically, uh, the jails, uh, if we go back to uh, pre COVID or uh, the pandemic, our average daily inmate population was about 17,000. Uh, as a result of the uh, pandemic, we uh, developed a strategic plan to reduce the population, um, primarily due to the pandemic and health concerns of our uh, daily population here in our system. That count went from 17,000 to uh, just under 13,000 uh, over the course of a few months in 2020. Uh, and it, that was a result of a number of strategies that we implemented in collaboration and partnership with uh, correctional health services here in a uh, custody division. Um, we have had a number of strategies that we implemented at the time, uh, such as we reduced the misdemeanor bail admittance from 25,000 to $50,000 uh, uh, unless one of the exception charges applied. Our traditionally county sentenced uh, inmates uh, charged uh, went from 180 days to 240 days for uh, what we refer to as shorts or early releases. That number used to be zero. We also uh, reduced our percentage percentage releases dropped to 10% for non M7 charges. Uh, that number was at one point uh, 100% of their uh, county sentence. And again, uh, we reduced it to 10%. We also uh, accelerated our releases of all incarcerated people by 30 days uh, using our authority under penal code section 4024.1. Um, we also continue to work collaboratively with the, with our justice partners at the courts, district attorney's office and the public defender's office on fel felony bail deviation for uh, releases of me medically vulnerable uh, individuals related to COVID-19. And then weekly we coordinate and collaborate with our partners at CDCR for uh, the transfer of state prison inmates that are uh, currently in county jail custody. Um, the number of uh, individuals that we uh, transfer, transfer to CDCR weekly averages about 150 to 200. If you recall, uh, during the pandemic, that number uh, of folks in our custody that were sentenced to state prison was as much as 3,000 that were in our system. Today, we average about 500 or so um, on a weekly basis. And again, we, we work collaboratively with CDCR to transfer those individuals that have been processed and are ready to go. Um, we also work with um, our state uh, hospitals for the transfer of individuals waiting to go to uh, state uh, mental health hospitals. Um, we continue to um, work with um, community-based organizations. Those uh, actually just prior to the holidays, I personally met virtually with uh, Ms. Uh, Judge Songhai Armstead of JCOD, our Justice Care and Opportunities Department. She and I briefly discussed uh, a number of strategies that uh, JCOD and, and Judge Armstead would like to implement. Um, I know that she has staff that has been working and meeting with our staff here at the Inmate Reception Center uh, bi-monthly, uh, developing strategies and looking at our current population to see who is uh, eligible and who we have the legal authority um, to release, uh, whether it be to community-based organizations or, or otherwise. Um, we have uh, began, begun to look at other strategies such as um, the release of pretrial inmates uh, to electric monitoring. That's something that is ongoing and we're still um, studying and to see uh, who would qualify in that population and what that would look like from the standpoint of budget, staffing, et cetera, uh, to do that uh, and ensure that, uh, again, we have the legal authority to release uh, any individual that would qualify for such a program. So that's something that is uh, also ongoing uh, here in uh, custody division related to um, our current uh, population. 
over the last uh, several weeks, as I mentioned, uh, pre-COVID, our population was as high as 17,000. Uh, during COVID, it was reduced to as low as just below 13,000. Over the last uh, several weeks and even several months, the population, the average daily population has averaged about 14,400, 14,500, which is where we've been for the last uh, few weeks. Any questions? Wait a minute, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I, I trying to- Commissioner Bonner? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the fact that uh, you've indicated certain data that reduce the average daily population uh, from 17,000 to 13,000, and undoubtedly those factors that you uh, <clears throat> Uh, noted uh, contributed to them. But one other factor you didn't mention was that during COVID, during the epidemic, there was actually a substantial reduction in arrest, not just by the sheriff's department, but by all of the police departments within LA County. And because there was a reduction in arrest, uh, particularly during the lockdown period, uh, that also, I mean, that had a substantial impact on the a reduction of the inmate population. And I'll, I'll just ask you, isn't that a fact, sir? Uh, no, uh, uh, thank you for, for adding that. Certainly, uh, that was one of many factors. And, and, and actually, uh, you, in your comments, you remind me that uh, the emergency zero bail schedule uh, that was uh, enacted by our uh, justice partners at the court was a factor in the population reduction. That was rescinded uh, June 30th of uh, last year, 2022. So that also con was a contributing factor both to our reduction and then to the increase in population post uh, June 30th of 2022. Thank you. I see. Are there any other commissioner questions? Doesn't look like it. Yeah, I, I am just curious about the effectiveness of the um, ankle bracelet and uh, if you have any experience on how well that works for release. Well, um, we, again, we have just started to assess that program and how it would look uh, given our current day population. Um, we have uh, staff here uh, internally, we're gonna meet with uh, not just JCOD, but also with uh, County Council uh, to see and evaluate, assess our current population that would even be eligible for such a program. Certainly, uh, we wanna be careful to uh, balance uh, you know, our need to depopulate with public safety. Uh, the individuals uh, that off the, you know, just uh, basically would even uh, uh, qualify for that program would be uh, nonviolent, non-sexual, non-serious offenders. Um, so we would again have to do an assessment of our current population to see whom we have the legal authority to release on such a program and, and how that would how it would look. So we still have a lot of, um, of um, research to do related to to that specific program i appreciate that i understand that there have been some other jurisdictions who have tried this they've run into some pretty significant technology problems and that some have reported back that it's it's better to stay in custody than trying to go out of custody with one of these devices because there's so many misfires and false alarms that they violated so i'm just hoping you're going to be doing some research there with those other jurisdictions who have Im implemented this to hopefully we can avoid those problems no thank you for those comments those are all uh things that uh are part of the conversation and our consideration as we move forward with the, with uh just the conversation uh that we plan to have related to that specific topic before we implement anything those type of questions and, and many others have to be answered. It's a, it's a, uh, we, we have to have a very robust and comprehensive policy um, to lay the foundations so that we are following uh, current uh, legal guidelines 
as well as department policies related to those releases and uh, how we're going to manage such a program um, for those that we release in, into the communities uh, under that type of program. So a lot of uh, study and careful thought has to go into um, that particular strategy before we, we are even close to implementing it. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Commissioner Johnson, and after that, we have Commissioner Rubin. Hello, and thank you. Thank you for being here today on behalf of the Sheriff's Department. I wanted to uh, raise two questions specifically involving uh, COVID precautions and the notices at the jail. Um, shortly, uh, just three months ago, I was able to uh, go uh, to Men's Central Jail. I'll be going again next month. And I wanted to ask about the return to posted COVID precautions and any uh, efforts to ensure compliance with COVID precautions at the jails. And related to that, based on some incidents last year um, involving whistleblowers who actually brought the uh, attacks on uh, people trying to instill and to educate uh, the uh, sworn officers and other sheriff's department staff at uh, jail facilities about COVID precautions and trying to ensure protection of the public and of uh, staff of the county um, in such facilities about COVID precautions, um, that there were concerns about uh, whistleblowers and the protection of whistleblowers uh, about conditions in the jail. So I wanted to just ask uh, one about any efforts to ensure COVID precautions and posting thereof uh, to protect staff and public visitors to the facilities and uh, any efforts to ensure uh, protection of whistleblowers, uh, which was not a high priority for the former administration, to say the least. Well, first, uh, thank you for the, the welcome and, and uh, uh, I appreciate the fact that you visited uh, Men's Central Jail. I, I encourage uh, any member of this commission to visit our jails. You're, you are all uh, always welcome. The door is open. Uh, we welcome your visits. Uh, we also welcome your, your suggestions and recommendations related to, to our jails. Um, um, we, we certainly understand that uh, this is not something where we operate in a, in a silo. Um, we, again, welcome comments and suggestions uh, from all stakeholders, and I think all of us, including our communities, our stakeholders in, in uh, current uh, jail conditions. Um, as it relates to, um, and, and I don't wanna speak uh, ahead of myself, I know that Dr. Belovich from Correctional Health Services is on the line and may be prepared to speak to some of these things, but uh, to answer your question generally, as it relates to whistleblowers, uh, we will abide by the law. Um, and uh, I can assure you of that. Um, uh, we recognize that, that our employees and those in our custody, uh, their care and safety is the number one priority. Again, and I stress that uh, although we focus rightfully on, on those individuals that are in our custody, we also focus on our employees, um, our, our, not only LSD employees, but the employees at Correctional Health Services, um, the various vendors and, and visitors that we get into our jail facilities on a daily basis. And their health and safety is also a paramount concern. So um, certainly we have postings related to uh, CDCR, uh, CDC, CDC, CDC uh, regulations and county health regulations related to uh, COVID precautions. We offer PPE to uh, our employees and our visitors um, in uh, uh, with the guidance of uh, Correctional Health Services, uh, the Department of Public Health, uh, and uh, CDC guidelines. And I don't know if Dr. Belovich wants to uh, expand on, on some of those uh, issues. Sure, thanks, uh, Sergio. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody. This is uh, Tim Belovich from Correctional Health Services. Um, thank you for asking us to be here today. Dr. Henderson, our Chief Medical Officer, is also on the line, who leads our day-to-day um, -day COVID uh, strategy um, in alignment with um, guidance from, uh, as the Assistant Sheriff said, the Centers for Disease Control Guidance and uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Um, Dr. Henderson could probably give more detail on it, but in general, our clinic facilities, we still require masks to be worn uh, by uh, all of the, by, by staff. Um, the inpatient units, it's also a requirement. Um, 
there was a change in the fall that allowed uh, staff, staff not to wear masks if they choose to in areas where healthcare is not being provided. Um, it's it prior to that change. Um, it's don't get me wrong. It's still difficult to enforce sometimes that mask mandate with the staff. Prior to that, it was very difficult, um, as I think you, you alluded to, Commissioner. Uh, and we had challenges on a regular basis. Um, the, the the leadership uh, was often strategizing on how we can increase uh, compliance with that mandate. Um, we counseled our staff at least at that time not to take on that challenge on their own and not to be confrontational about individuals who weren't wearing masks, but that they could call and call up here and let us know anonymously if there was an area or uh, individuals who were not wearing masks. Um, the, the benefit we have is we do have a lot of cameras here. We would be able to then verify ourselves where there are areas where, where mask compliance was, was low or was not occurring. And we would work with uh, with custody, especially um, to, you know, to try to rectify that. We had instances where healthcare staff were not wearing masks. Um, we addressed that through um, through corrective actions as well. Um, but in terms of, of where we stand today, um, Dr. Henderson, can you maybe give a better description than I did as to what the, the current requirement is and where uh, masks are required? Well, we, I think you, good morning. Still morning, yes, good morning. Um, I think you did a fine job. That, thank you. The requirement that we have right now is that any patient contact by healthcare professionals considered to be, uh, need to be masked. Both, we ask the patient to be masked and we have, we require the care, the caregiver to be masked. In areas where there's group uh, care going on, a medical clinic, uh, the urgent care center or the correctional treatment center, everyone, has to be masked, the patient, the um, custody staff, and the care provider. Um, and it is, you know, there because where they can, people can move through the jail system and the rules change as you move through the building, we see the occasional lapse, but um, Mr. Aloma and his staff are pushing that message down as are we on a constant basis. And we did, to, as Dr. Belovich stated, we did encourage our staff to not uh, argue with others about it, but rather just to refer to us for administrative action. So I, I, that's, and that would be still in place, I think. Thank you. Uh, our next commissioner uh, question is from Commissioner Rubin. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, welcome to. Sheriff Luna, we are happy, so, so happy that you were here and partic will part be participating on a basis. Um, I have a question relating to um, improving conditions in the IRC. We heard a lot of um, awful information within the last months, last summer, particularly, and um, there was talk at the time of changing the amount of time that um, that new inmates were um, basically being stuck in the IRC because of uh, sorts of issues. And um, Mr. Lemma, I don't know if that's a subject you're going to talk about or um, you know anybody else from the sheriff's department, but it's an issue that um, this commission and the public are very concerned about. I, thank you for those comments, Commissioner. Um, yes. Um, so, as as you all know, uh, the conditions in the IRC um, this past year um, were concerning, concerning to all of us as it relates to uh, individuals that were in our uh, reception area awaiting awaiting housing, uh, awaiting uh, medical or mental health evaluations, and, and any number of reasons that caused uh, those delays. Uh, as you know, that resulted in a uh, TRO being filed by the uh, American Civil Liberties Union. And actually, uh, you know, uh, that it, it's uh, it's unfortunate that it came to that, but certainly it, after uh, that happened, it forced us to look uh, internally to our processes um, in the IRC, as well as housing, uh, available housing that we had 
particularly for our mental health population. So uh, a couple of things that we did as a result uh, was that we changed uh, the internal clock in the IRC. And, and I have to clarify that because we've always had a clock at the IRC. Um, the clock is a 24-hour uh, clock. It's commonly referred to. But we additionally had a 16-hour clock that was uh, specific to the clinic area. Uh, so now we've changed that process to now we have one clock for 24 hours. We have uh, a mechanism in place where that is monitored uh, uh, on every shift by the watch commanders to ensure that we don't have anyone in the IRC that is uh, delayed unnecessarily um, for uh, housing. We've also uh, increased uh, and expanded, I should say, uh, mental health housing for uh, uh, medium observation housing individuals at our Pitches Detention Center North facility, which has, I think, also helped and contribute to um, uh, some of the, uh, alleviating some of the crowding uh, in the IRC. So it's been a couple things um, that have, I think, resulted in a better outcome since that TRO was filed, and we keep an eye on it. Uh, uh, our executives, uh, command staff at the IRC, uh, both uh, uh, we receive reports uh, every shift as to what the numbers are specifically in the IRC. If there are any uh, delays beyond the 24 hour period, they have to be reported and as a reason as to why the delay occurred. And uh, our plans to, uh, again, move those uh, folks out to appropriate housing uh, within our facilities. Can you give us some indication as to what the average time is um, currently or, uh, and I know that that's, you know, that's often hard to do, but the numbers were so terrible last summer. So what, what would be an average amount of time that an inmate would um, be remaining in the IRC before they're given housing? So, uh, you know, certainly that number fluctuates uh, from day to day uh, based on a number of different variables. Um, you know, holiday weekends, uh, uh, the time may be um, longer uh, than uh, during the week uh, or on the weekends where it's not a holiday weekend, um, and it varies from shift to shift. But the since the TRO was filed, um, again, I've been uh, monitoring those numbers very closely every day, every shift, as do the command staff at IRC, our division chiefs do the same. Um, the average time has been under uh, 24 hours for the overwhelming majority. Uh, we have had some that have gone over. And again, those instances where they go over require explanation uh, and then a uh, plan to correct that and have them housed. Sometimes, they may be going uh, over the, the clock, for example, recently, uh, because they have to go out to uh, an outside uh, medical facility for further medical evaluation. That's an example. And that, but the clock keeps ticking. Um, so, but those instances are now specifically documented so that now we know why someone is over the 24 hour clock. If, if it's a, something to that effect where they've, again, had to go out to an outside medical facility for, for evaluation, um, just one example, um, we know that that is the issue um, so that then we can uh, triage uh, anyone who is over the 24-hour uh, period. Um, can you, what can you do to reduce the, even the 24-hour number? Well, um, you know, I think it's, it's a number of factors that, um, that play into that. It's, it's housing, it's, uh, it's uh, our ability, you know, again, um, the numbers on intake pretty much, um, I think, um, impact um, the numbers at IRC. And then, uh, you know, everyone that comes in has to be medically assessed. They have to have a mental health assessment. So we have to have, um, and, and we do, um, you know, our partners at uh, Correctional Health Services, uh, both on the medical side and the mental health side, work very hard and very diligently uh, in our intake uh, areas to make sure that uh, folks are assessed in a timely manner um, so that they can then be housed. But it takes a collaboration between CHS and uh, uh, custody staff to ensure that's happening. And, and I, I believe that it is. Um, uh, 
uh, despite uh, staffing challenges that I think both our departments have, uh, everyone's working very hard to ensure that uh, we are staying on top of that. If I could jump in uh, as well on that, uh, Assistant Chair. Um, as the Assistant Chair said, there are uh, uh, several factors involved there. One of the factors in reducing the 24 hour clock has to do with the flow of the, the inmates or the patients that come in. When, if we're lucky enough that patients trickle in, they can be seen quite quickly by healthcare and assessed and, and dispositioned. What that's not ever the case. What happens is we get two to 300 individuals all coming at once around four in the afternoon that all that all need to be processed. Um, there's no way for healthcare to staff that way because I would need to put 40, 60, 80 in clinicians down there to move them through quickly. But even if we were able to do that, housing them would, would become a glut. So the real problem is how they come to us en masse. Um, but, but also, uh, to, to go back to the original question of the, the, uh, the IRC and the issues in the IRC, I think it's important that we, we also point out to you that the issues in the IRC are a symptom of the fact that we don't have the beds to place people in once they're dispositioned. So, so processing them is one, one thing, but getting them a, an appropriate bed is another thing. And that's where we really find the hang up. Um, and again, it has to do with the population we're trying to serve. Even though we only, we only have, and I say only in quotes, we only have 14,500 and that's in comparison to the 17,000 we used to have. We have a much more difficult time finding housing for these individuals because the makeup of the population has so significantly changed. There are close to 6,900 individuals in mental health, um, mental health programs today. And that's, that is a vast difference from six or seven years ago when we had 3,500. So, um, you know, as I said last week, when I, I was speaking to the, the board of supervisors, we will not be able to care for this population when it is, when it is comprised of this, there are just not enough beds to serve the population. And and so again, the the the, the IRC issue is true and and a true issue in and of itself, but it's also a symptom of a different issue. Thank I, you. We have a question from our Inspector General Max Huntsman. Uh, I, yeah, I wanted to jump in and just repeat what um, Dr. Belovich just said because it's really important. He spoke at the Board of Supervisors last week and told them that based on the legal uh, consent decrees we currently have, or settlement agreements we currently have in court orders, uh, we cannot be in compliance with any increase in budget or any kind of additional capacity within uh, our current jail system for certain of the conditions. There are some that we can we, by, by beefing things up. And as he described to you, there's some mechanical problems and there's things you can do to address it, such as the, the spike of people entering at a particular time could be addressed uh, through a more comprehensive bus fleet that would bring people in at different times and then would allow medical staff to, to process them. But the fundamental problem of insufficient housing within our jail facilities will not change and as long as we are as substantially a, a, a above the, the cap on the bscc as we are we will continue to have these problems and as dr belovich told you irc is merely a symptom of general overcrowding it is it can be improved it's a bottleneck but it but the overcrowding problem cannot be eliminated uh, and just just uh, the previous uh, weekend, I went down to the jails because there was an attempt by the Population Management Bureau to convert a specialized kind of um, mental health care facility to just ge a more generic version of just warehousing people. And that and that shows you uh, the the difficulty of trying to cram this number of people into the facilities we have. So I just want to repeat what I think Dr. Dr. Belovich said accurately last week and said again just now is that we really must, to comply with our constitutional legal obligations, bring down the population of the jail. And we have the tools. We have the legal tools available to us. Um, and I won't go into the details of how, but it, it's, it's something that needs to be done immediately. It needed to be done years ago. Thank you. Now we will, we will hear from 
uh, Civil Brand Commission Chair Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson and Commissioner Cheryl Grills. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's such an important one um, and certainly want to reflect back to you all that several of the other commissioners on Civil Brand who's responsible for doing inspections in uh, the custody setting, uh, talking to not just people held in custody, but clinicians to sheriff staff, um, and then uh, offering our reports uh, to the sheriff to figure out how we address some of the issues that we see. Uh, also, are really encouraged by this kind of cross pollinization of COC and some of our work because I think some of the issues we have to address um, are are serious as we're as we're discussing. And so. On the agenda, we have a conversation on in custody debts, uh, overcrowding, and inmate reception center, and um, pregnant people in jails, as well as related matters. I'm going to take uh, a start at the overcrowding and in inmate reception center process and in custody deaths because I think there's a related piece there, and we'll pass it to uh, Commissioner Grills. Um, who will talk about other issues specifically around pregnant people in jails, but also more broadly CRDF. And so I think, you know, I want to frame this conversation by just offering to you all, um, you know, obviously we know that 2021 was a really horrific year in terms of custody deaths. We saw the most deaths we've seen in a decade. Um, what's also important to know is that the mortality rate um, inside of custody has also been increasing. Um, over the last decade from 10 folks for every 10,000 to 27 for, the, for every 10,000. And the average jail population is 36 uh, years of age. The average age of those who are dying is 46, uh, which is raising a lot of questions for us around the premature nature of death in custody. Uh, we also know that Black folks particular in particular are 29% of the jail population and 36% of in custody deaths. Latinx folks are 53% of the jail population, 36% of those who died. I wanna lean specifically into how deaths are designated uh, by the medical examiner and coroner's office. We've seen a threefold increase over the last decade and the increase in uh, mortality of people who are being designated as natural or accidental deaths. And when you hear the term natural, I think there's a tendency to interpret uh, someone dying as part of the natural or reasonable course uh, of their body, of their physiology. And we feel like it's absolutely critical that we challenge that assumption and that we look at as it's particularly as inspectors who are going in and looking at conditions that people are living in and what they're telling us, um, that we actually look at a social determinants of health approach to this, where someone's sleeping, someone's nutrition, someone's access to physical activity, showers, the complaint process, timely medical care are all stressors that can contribute to the mortality rate. Uh, in fact, an analysis of 59 autopsies that was done by UCLA and Dignity and Power Now, who I'm also the executive director of, did uh, look at autopsy reports and found that 85% of people who were designated uh, having died of a natural cause had evidence of uh, some type of mental health disability, and 54% of them over the last de decade, over between 2009 and 2019, had evidence of physical brutality on their bodies, right? And so when we talk about any death designation, I think we need to step back and look at what are the conditions that people are in. Uh, we look at cardiovascular disease in the jails as one of the leading cause of death. Uh, again, a great concern for us, uh, cardiovascular disease is one of the leading causes of death in the world. Uh, however, 66% of people who die of cardiovascular disease are 75 years uh, old uh, or older in just general outside of a jail and custody context. The average age of someone who dies of cardiovascular disease in our jails is 51. And 50% of people who have died in the custody uh, of cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease are black folks. Um, so again, to the notion of looking at how conditions produce stressors on the body, stressors on the mind, stressors on people's health, they create a premature, in this case, cardiovascular disease. It's really important that we're looking at 
uh, these conditions and also situated within the context of a broader uh, orientation that the county is in right now around care for jail last around the closure of men's central jail, which is now including shifting around of certain populations that is creating challenges that we want to share with you today that we feel is really important to shed light on. I think some of the direct observations that we see and tend to be some of the trends. Um, one is folks not having access to a complaint process, uh, lack of adequate physical activity, uh, inadequate medical care or timely medical care that people complain of, uh, substandard nutrition, and just some of the examples that I will offer you in that. Uh, in a June inspection we did at MCJ uh, of the 5800 unit, uh, there was no drinking water available and all the fountains in that 5800 dorm uh, were broken. And at the time, there were no work orders in uh, to actually uh, correct the fountains. Um, when we get these type of requests or with these complaints, we do bring them to our liaison, Commander Macias. Um, and in some cases, it is, it is fixed. In some cases, it is, it is not. And I'll tell you an example um, where uh, in inspecting a uh, unit previously, what we found is that uh, in September, there was no hot water in the 2700 cells in MCJ. Um, and we were told by the local watch commander that there were multiple um, emergency requests made for hot water and to fix this. We followed up with Commander Macias, who clarified for us that those work orders were not in, but actually sent a plumber out uh, to fix the issue. The plumber did go out. Uh, our commissioner followed up with the person who complained, who was in custody, who was being held, um, who said that the hot water didn't last. Um, and that we asked them, okay, what? What else is here that you want us to look at? And they essentially said they didn't want to complain about the hot water anymore because they didn't feel like it was going to change. And so something as simple um, as people's access to water um, could be deflating to the point where folks don't want to complain about it. We have to imagine what it might feel like to have delays in medical care, uh, fears of retaliation about other issues. Um, and so uh, that is part of the context and the approach that we're and the lens that we're looking at when we look at these issues. Uh, in a similar uh, inspection that we did back in June in MCJ, uh, one person told us that they had not seen a doctor since April, um, which is about three months. Um, and we regularly meet in our meetings with Dr. Belovich and uh, Dr. Henderson, who were pretty forward with us that, you know, there's simply just not enough uh, ability for them to meet the needs. And so what is happening is there is a responsiveness to acuity um, that we're seeing and delays on people who have needs that get worse. Um, and folks who continue to report to us, hey, I made, a com I made a request to see a doctor. I made a request to see a nurse. I made a request for, for a, a psyche eval, whatever it may be. Uh, and those delays um, happen. I think the other uh, kind of piece I think it's important when we're talking about the inmate reception center is that um, I think it's really important we're looking at the inmate reception center. Yes, as a symptom of other things, um, but there's a the corrections that are happening around trying to address the needs of the population, uh, some of which Dr. Belovich talked about uh, in terms of trying to identify particularly units to house people is in some ways displacing the problem. One of the concerns that we had around inmate reception centers that people with mental health disabilities were having serious delays in getting housed, right? Um, and so those conditions, in terms of the conditions of people who have mental health disabilities, in some ways are still very, very inadequate. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the units that is now being used uh, to house people with for medium observation housing is uh, five that the 5,000 unit in Men's Central Jail. Um, and that is obviously housing people with mental health disabilities in men's central jail is, is a problem in and of, in and of itself. Um, but people routinely complain of, um, you know, not having the needs that they have. And in fact, one of the things that we saw was a uh, commissioner had done an inspection uh, at 5,000 and, and observed um, the transfer of someone from the MOH unit who was supposed to be transferred to HOH and Twin Towers. Um, and what we were told and what our commissioner observed is that because the uh, patients had spit on 
one of the deputies, the deputies had to essentially control the situation. Uh, our commissioners were asked to be removed from the floor. They did continue to observe um, and nothing happened. They was essentially the patient was surrounded by by deputies. And later we found out that a use of force did actually occur in that transfer. Um, Commissioner Grills, in, I'm sorry to interrupt. If we can have Commissioner Grills provide an overview of the women's facility and uh, what her observations may be there. For sure. Let me just wrap up this point. Uh, I think what's important to note here is that um, there was no clinical staff present. There was no JMET team present. There was no one available to actually de-escalate that situation. Um, and so you're holding, holding people in conditions that are uh, overcrowded, uh, tense, people feel uh, unsafe, people feel on the inability to sleep. Um, and to the, to the degree that they are addressing that, some of these folks are moved to the 4300 unit, which is a disciplinary block, where when we spoke to the sheriffs in charge of that unit, there was no differentiation being made between the people who were there because they didn't feel capable of uh, being housed in 5000 and folks being held on discipline who have no access to rec, no access to food, no, I mean, excuse me, canteen, no access to phone, those type of things. And so these conditions are of grave concern for us. Thank you. Commissioner Grills, if you can give us an overview of the women's facility. Okay. Um, so in terms of pregnant women in custody, we have not seen any dramatic changes in the number of pregnant women in custody from the last few inspections. Um, the concerns that we raised in the past with respect to access to water uh, has been addressed by the Sheriff's Department. We are unable to report on any noteworthy changes related to our concerns about the amount of physical activity that the pregnant women can engage in. That would be things like walking the perimeter of the module a few times a day. Uh, we'll continue to monitor that and update you later. Other CRDF concerns um, have emerged though with respect to investigations of reported personnel um, for retaliation. So, over a, well over a year ago, we identified several um, personnel in the sheriff's department who were cited by people that we talked to who were incarcerated that they um, had been retaliated against for raising concerns about um, discrimination against the black women in the jails. A, a, a year later, we still have no information on the status of the investigation that the captain has repeatedly told us uh, that she has been um, uh, implementing. Um, other, other concerns, there is PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Questions have been raised for us related to what is the response to someone who submits a PREA complaint? The question at hand is, is the procedure in fact punitive, even though it, it may be des described as something for the person's protection? Uh, for example, um, we observed one case that we followed for a long time of the woman who made a PREA complaint and she was moved to a high observation unit that results in isolation. And so that was feeling punitive to her and to us. Uh, and uh, she had repeated retaliation concerns. In terms of the IRC at CRDF, um, we have concerns about respecting the dignity of women in the cells, the CCTV observation cameras, can actually were positioned so that you could actually see the women using the toilets. Um, and we tested it out ourselves, uh, Commissioner Miller and I. Um, and we're not sure yet if that has been remedied. In addition, in the IRC, multiple sinks and phones are not working. There's very poor maintenance of the cells. Deep cleaning is definitely needed. But um, there were new curtains put up in the area where women have to fully disrobe. And we had raised concerns about that. There are ongoing mental health issues and concerns at CRDF and across all of the jails. And given that, as Dr. Belovich has noted um, to, see, to the Civil Grant Commission, where, where they're running at approximately a 40% vacancy rate, it's not surprising that at every single inspection, we receive multiple complaints related to timely access to medical treatment and to mental health treatment. Um, and so that what ends up happening is that there are long waits to be seen. There's limited follow up after psychotropic medications are prescribed. There's extremely limited psychotherapy or behavioral health interventions. 
and no real prevention or early intervention services that I could discern outside of EBI. And if I could just take one minute to give you an update because COC and Civil Brand Commission were charged by the Board of Supervisors to do a survey of uh, edu education-based incarceration um, concerns, needs, and preferences. The, the survey has been completed, the report has been written, and it's undergoing edits. And as soon as that is done, we'll be uh, sharing that with you. But just to give you a couple of highlights, a representative sample of people, a total of 814 folks incarcerated across the LA County jails voluntarily pr participated in the survey. And we have really good representation across all of the jails. While interest in classes was high, access did not match interest levels. 71% of people said EBI programs were never or, for, or rarely made available to them. There's overwhelmingly strong interest in participating in EBI classes and programs across all jails. Almost all respondents, 97% said they were interested in, that, in a class within at least one of nine categories of classes we uh, presented to them. Despite high interest in classes, most respondents were not able to enroll. Only 36% of the 814 people um, were able to enroll in at least one class. The lowest course enrollment was found at Twin Towers and Men's Central. The highest was at CRDF. Transgender and non-binary people in custody expressed high interest in classes, but they had the worst access among all demographic groups. Black respondents across all jails reported the lowest access to EBI classes. Only 26% of black respondents compared to 43% of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans and 41% of white respondents were able to enroll in classes. And lastly, Men's Central Jail had the lowest ratings in each of the four categories that we assess. Um, least interest in classes currently offered, least interest in classes that could be offered, worst access to classes, and reported the most class cancellations. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the subject matter experts on this issue uh, and the commission and the public for your time related to the significant issue. Uh, we're going to turn this back over and submit to the commission for uh, Chair Kennedy and the commission to hear from our sheriff, Sheriff Luna, and then we'll return back to uh, public comments and what have you on this issue. Again, thank you very much. So uh, we've just you know, heard a lot about the custody situation. Sheriff, is there anything you wanna say in response or? Well, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for all your work. There's a lot of uh, effort uh, that I hear uh, is taking place. Very impressed with your knowledge of the operations that are there. Uh, and more importantly from just a humanistic approach. I, I really appreciate the fact that you're talking about this, uh, that you're bringing this uh, forward. Um, it is our uh, obligation uh, to make sure that we make as many uh, corrections uh, as we possibly can. There's some challenges. Uh, we know that. Uh, I knew this when I took this job, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I need to be held accountable uh, for what happens here. Um, and I have confidence in our staff, uh, uh, not only the sheriff's staff, but other county staff that working together, uh, we can at least uh, cor make corrections in a lot of these areas. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I just went to sheriff school last week uh, where there I spent a week with 27 new sheriffs out of 58, which in itself is unprecedented. Uh, just tells you about the change that people in our great state are asking for. Uh, but as we did some forecasting and looking out at state budgets, for example, uh, uh, you know, more prisons closing in the state, which sounds great, uh, but yet more of the populations that were going to be in those prisons uh, were taking in at the county level. Uh, if you're looking at the mental health challenges that we face in this state, 
Um, we're getting more and more clients, patients. Uh, and I've got to tell you, as I'm listening to this, uh, I wish I could report to you that we didn't have in custody one uh, patient or client that was suffering from uh, mental health uh, challenges. Uh, they don't belong in our custody facilities, but yet uh, we are the only option uh, in many cases. Uh, and, and we need to figure that out, working with other partners, working with all of you, uh, whether it's as commissioners or advocates, uh, whatever it takes uh, to make this situation better. And I'm just going to end it by saying I'm committed uh, to doing all this, uh, to doing all this very important work. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from uh, commissioners about the presentation? Yes, Hans. We can't. We can't hear you, Hans. Thank you. Uh, I want to commend the Civil Brand Commission here, uh, op, uh, commissioners who are here and provided such uh, wonderful follow up uh, for not just accountability, but the edification of myself and fellow commissioners here and all participating. Um, those were stellar reports, um, and I want to thank those who helped effectuate those reports uh, through the supervisors and the motion before the supervisors that led to this research and this report. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the assistant sheriff and the sheriff for being here and wanted to ask um, what steps might be taken given uh, the glaring gaps in availability of uh, programs that was reported on by uh, our civil brand commissioners uh, present here today. Uh, what steps can be taken to ensure access, equitable access? We saw. Uh, in the reporting data, the gross inequities uh, for uh, especially Latina, Latino and African-American uh, incarcerated people. What can be done to improve access to the robust programs uh, and respond to those glaring uh, inequities that were spotlighted in the findings of our of our esteemed colleagues here? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I, I'll, I'll take that question and uh, thank you for asking it. You know, I, I believe uh, that program programming is essential in um, really the healing process of those in our custody. Educational programs, uh, work programs uh, made available to all individuals in our custody, regardless of um, gender or, or race or ethnicity. Um, it, my expectation is that those programs are uh, extended to everyone that comes into our custody. The challenge that we have is that not all individuals coming into our into our custody facilities um, uh, qualify for those programs. There are certain um, charges, for example, uh, and disqualifiers uh, that uh, disqualify them for uh, participation in our programs, whether it's their criminal charges, whether it's uh, me medical or mental health uh, issues that disqualify them. There's there's a number of reasons, but my expectation is, is that every eligible individual, whether into our male or female facilities, are offered those programs. They're important uh, to, to their uh, mental health, their physical health. Uh, where we need to do a better job is of tracking the offer that's made at intake and then following up with those individuals because it's not uncommon for someone coming in at intake to, for any number of reasons, refuse uh, those programs. Uh, but the expectation is that there's there has to be some sort of follow up, whether it's a couple weeks or 30 days later, to, to ensure that mm. maybe they haven't changed their mind. And uh, also following up with town hall meetings uh, in our housing uh, areas to uh, by our staff to um, encourage people and explain the benefits of the programs as well as the type of programs that are available to them. I think it's a, a matter of you know, constant messaging to our population that those programs are available. And again, if they qualify for them, we encourage them to participate. Uh, but I also have to stress that participation is voluntary. Um, so we, we encourage them though to, to participate. We, we are looking into a software uh, program 
to track uh, some of these things of which I speak. The, the offer that's initially made to each individual at intake, as well as the follow up uh, and the reasons why, if they decline to participate, why they're declining so that we have a better understanding and, and maybe use that data um, to, uh, you know, increase our, our, our outreach and our services uh, related to those educational and work programs to our population. I, I'll be brief. I, I, I'll shut up here in just a second, but I want to just build on, I guess, the pun that the sheriff invoked a moment ago, that there are some corrections that need to be done in corrections. Um, I want to follow up about the follow up, because if we can have a specific follow up regimen, I mean, let's be real about what uh, Commissioner Grills mentioned that the conditions at intake, let's be real, are about trying to make sure that people in suffering one of the worst moments of their of their lives, sometimes being screened or dealing with lack of privacy for bodily functions that require privacy or inspection of body cavities. Those are that that is not a high priority dealing with programming. But if there's follow up that can be done within a regular uh, interval afterwards, can we regularize that and maybe have uh, some protocol about what that interval for follow up is and maybe some report back? Building on the report that we heard today about what the compliance with that follow up interval um, on program availability or enrollment might be. I, I agree with you. Um, there needs to be follow up. We can't just leave it at intake and then assume that uh, they're not going to change their minds or um, that, uh, again, that follow up is essential and ensuring, as you mentioned, um, many stressors that they're experiencing at intake uh, that maybe uh, during some uh, regular interval that is part of our, our policies and also tracking mechanisms for that have to be in place. JP. Thank you, just kind of following on with, with Commissioner Johnson. A um, couple things, uh, and Dr. Riles mentioned it, you know, I, I totally understand how, you know, getting a sudden influx of Four or 500 inmates all at once makes the uh, process at inmate reception center just very, very, very difficult. And I don't have an easy fix for that, as I'm sure no one does, because if there was an easy fix, it would have been done. Uh, but I'm hoping we can look at some creative, perhaps, ways of looking at this. And we may need to look at having our transportation uh, deputies make multiple trips from our courthouses to kind of break that up during the day. I know that's a pretty heavy lift. I'm not saying that as if that's a quick and easy fix, but I hope that's being looked at. There may be some way to, to ameliorate this to some degree. I don't know that we'll ever get rid of it entirely. because There's always going to be those surges and I, and I totally understand that, but I hope we are looking at every possible way to ameliorate at least that. Something else uh, the sheriff mentioned, and it, it concerns me greatly because I've been following this myself, how you know, we would all love to have all of our state prisons closed. That would be a wonderful thing. However, uh, as we are suffering this incredible amount of overcrowding, I find it just incredible that all these beds at the state level are being vacated when, as the sheriff mentioned, that just means a lot of these people are going to be pushed down to our level, just like realignment did. And it just puts so much pressure on the county that I think we need to really take a good hard look at uh, going to the state and saying, look, are there some ways we can help in keeping some of these beds available? I, I get it. We don't like people in state prison. However, I think most, quite frankly, most inmates might uh, uh, feel this way. And I, I will take that from personal experience talking to inmates, but it's been a number of years ago where they preferred being in state prison as opposed to being in county jail because the living conditions are so much better for them in state prisons. Now, I hope that's still the case. I don't know that it is or it isn't, but it just bothers me to, to hear about all these state prisons closing and all these beds going offline that I think we all know that uh, the inmate population, as much as we would like to see it decrease and do everything we can to have the overall inmate population decrease at both the county and the state level, there are still gonna be those instances where we need to incarcerate people and if we can do it in a more humane manner in not such crowded conditions, we need to uh, do everything we can in our power to uh, 
encourage our legislators and CDC, whoever uh, has their handle on this on the throttle of this thing to take a good hard look. And if we can partner with them somehow um, to re um, reimagine those facilities into maybe something else so we can continue to utilize those beds when needed, I think that would be a good thing to look at. So there's a, a general comment. Thank you. Um, OK, Luis. So I just wanted to comment. Um, well, thank you uh, to our SBC commissioners and their um, comprehensive update. And you know, when I what I heard, and you know, which brings it down to my own experience, is you know, is the conditions of the jail. Um, you know, as a commissioner who who entered IRC in 1986 at the age of 18, and who entered IRC in Twin Towers in the 90s and did go to state prison and on a violation in 97, and I couldn't wait to get out of county jail. Um, you know, this common theme of, and I actually did get my high school diploma in, in CRDF when males were there in 1995. Um, you know, this common theme of the conditions of the jail has, we all know, has been um, going on for decades. and. You know, I think right now there is this window opportunity with the Care First, um, you know, Act, and I think you know, a collaboration with CHS and custody, um, you know, and the responsibility, you know, under the sheriff, you know, for the care, you know, care of those in custody, brings it back down to this inmate grievance area that I um, was reviewing in our report in the staff report. Uh, and I heard from from SB, you know, the the civil brand commissioners as well. And, I, and I'm bringing this up to, um, I guess my question is, is, is that in the Title 15 for minimum standards for grievances, um, I believe there is in there, um, you know, like a follow through, an outcome of, of, you know, inmates grievance. And so I guess my question would be in these town halls and in the actual formal grievance process, is there an, is there like a resolution process where um, a grievance is heard and and resolved, and that's communicated back to the to the person incarcerated. I'll, I'll answer that. So the inmate uh, grievance process or request process is something, that, as you know, is uh, available at all our facilities. The, the expectation is that uh, inmates have access uh, to those grievances and can file them at, at any time related to whether it's uh, grievances against staff or uh, grievances related to living or housing conditions, uh, those are collected on a regular basis. And the expectation is that they, those formal grievances that are submitted are followed up on with the individual that uh, submitted it. Now, there's also uh, informal grievances. For example, I mentioned earlier um, town halls. We conduct regular town halls at all of our facilities. Uh, that gives uh, individuals an opportunity to uh, voice their complaints or concerns related to any number of issues. They're, they're, uh, sometimes uh, they vary obviously from, from facility to facility, uh, but those can also be addressed by uh, staff on the spot uh, when they're communicated verbally. And that process actually happens uh, really every day um, in, in an informal way, but we do have a formal a grievance process so it's documented and we can track it and certainly if it's a a systemic issue or something that is ongoing we can we can address it uh, as soon as possible but there the expectation and policy is that there is follow-up with every individual that files a, a grievance thank you and just one other um insight now as far as like with regards to grievances um that would be for example targeted towards um CHS, how does that get rooted or routed? Is that is there a separate grievance process or is it channeled through through the share custody end? Uh, so th this is Tim. Um, there's there are two ways uh, that patients can can uh, voice a need. There is the grievance process exactly as the assistant sheriff uh, described, but we also have a um, health services request form where. Uh, 
where patients can put in if they want to be seen or something, uh, if, if it's a health related request. So they need to be seen, they feel that their medications need to be looked at again, things like that. Um, it is a very broken process. There are over 10,000 pieces of paper that come across our desk every month um, that uh, patients fill out needing to be seen. So it is, it's completely unwieldy. We've put in uh, last year, we did not get it. We put in again this year. We've asked for a computerized system where patients can uh, use a kiosk in the housing units and file a health service request. Um, it's, you know, a lot of jails and prisons uh, have that kind of technology where then you have, you know, certain words are flagged for uh, urgency. Um, but uh, at this point, we have not gotten approval for that funding um, to, to implement that program. But I, I think you can understand that it's impossible for us to um, to manually manage 10,000 sheets of paper every month yeah. as an add on to what we're trying to do. Thank you. Sure. Um, Cheryl, you wanted to jump in and then Patty. Thank you. I just wanted to say on the issue of grievances, there were a lot of things that we had to leave out in what we reported on. Um, and if I had more time, I would have raised the issue of grievances because what we have found and we did a deep dive into grievances is that people, uh, it's a mixed bag and it's very problematic. And I think that uh, Dr. Belovich is right on point with this needs to be turned into some kind of digitized process um, and a database to track it. People are not getting adequate responses to their grievances. Sometimes they're not getting responses at all. And sometimes they are afraid of retaliation from submitting grievances. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in that area. Patty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, I have, I don't have a question per se as, as, as more of a, a comment and what I'm gleaning from, uh, our session today. Uh, first of all, I want to, of course, welcome Sheriff Luna. Your presence here is, and along with your uh, senior staff, is a breath of fresh air as we start off this 2023. And I'm reminded of your of your pledge at your installation, where you talk, you talked about your commitment to collaboration, communication, transparency, and kindness. And I'm glad we're starting off this year with you leading with those, with that pledge. So I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm also struck um, by the, you know, we've been around what, it was five years now, five and a half years. And the last okay. year, it's been in the last year where we've had more collaborate, talk about collaboration, collaboration with C Civil Brand Institute. Um, and, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. I think this is something moving ahead. We want to make sure that we link that our commission links with the civil brand commission. Also the work, obviously, that the inspector general has been doing in the jails. But what, what's coming up for me is again, it's a comment and an opinion is. I'm feeling a sense of priority for us as a commission. Um, and um, the priorities being what's going on in the jails, the conditions in the jails, the use of force, and deputy gangs. That's what's coming in. And I know that we've reoriented our ad hocs uh, to focus on that. And so I just want to challenge us to stay, figure out what our priorities are, you know, for every month and connecting to the month before and getting more results out of all of the work that we do together and our collaborations with the with the sheriff's department with the inspector general and with civil brand i think um and of course hearing from the community and staying connected to the community groups is just essential for us turning this page and and moving toward where our commission along with these other groups can really make some change um in this new 2023 year of the rabbit uh, Mark Anthony. Thank you, Commissioner Giggins. I think your comment is kind of in line with where I wanted to go and and also in response to Commissioner Harris, which is trying to think 
creatively about where people should go. And, you know, I've also heard people say, you know, send me to state prison. I don't want to be in, in the, the county jails, right? But what we've also heard is people want to be home. People want to be diverted. And what the county has established is that that is the primary paradigm we should be operating from. And my one of my gravest concerns right now is as we're talking about closing men's central jail, and my hope is that Sheriff Luna will uh, be a part of the momentum to prioritize that and helping us set a timeline to do that, is that people who have mental health disabilities are being moved to other units that are not meant for any type of care, including men's central jail at 5,000 and 4,300 including pitches north. And in this particular moment, we discussed this in our uh, Civil Brand Commission meeting yesterday, and Commander Macias uh, said he would help at least the Civil Brand Commission get a clear picture of this. But there is no place where we can understand use of force on mental, people with mental health disabilities specifically. Uh, you can look at it at Twin Towers, but you can't look at it anywhere else. And given that many hundreds of people Hundreds of patients are being moved right now outside of Twin Towers. That is a grave, grave concern. Uh, and so one of the things I hope we can do, and my hope is that the, the sheriff will commit to this, is not only commit to helping us drive towards a timeline to amend central jail's closure, but also help us understand how these conditions are actually increasing use of force or not, getting us, giving us a clear picture of the mental health conditions for people, um, who are being moved throughout the jails, uh, and how do we address this using that care for his jail last approach? Uh, Patty, you wanted to say something again, or is that an old oh, hand? No. That's, that's an old hand up okay. there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, JP. I see you have another one. Um, when, I guess, Sergio, maybe for you, although really, I, I don't know who it's for. When we talk about uh, education based incarceration and other forms of programming, those things, they, they seem like such good things. Um, but you said there are disqualifiers. Uh, what are the disqualifiers and who makes them? Well, those are, are set by both uh, state law and um, penal code sections. Uh, Related to, for example, our M7s uh, do not qualify. Our, those are our serious and violent offenders don't qualify for a certain uh, programming. Um, so there's uh, those that have certain mental health uh, conditions that do not qualify for uh, education or, or work programs. So that's all managed uh, by our units, uh, our EBI, and um, our, our uh, uh, Inmate Services Bureau as to who uh, at the various facilities will uh, qualify for specific programs. There's at intake, there's an assessment done um, on these various uh, disqualifiers as to who is unable to, and, and those are uh, documented uh, in our system so that uh, we are ensuring that those that do qualify are, are offered the services, but then of course we have, like I said, those that are in for serious or violent uh, offenses, uh, that's a disqualifier. That's just one example. Is there a list that the commission or, uh, you know, any written uh, framework that the commission could uh, look out, look at to, to see that? And if so, um, can we get that? Because Sergio, like I have represented so many young people convicted of homicide who have gone on to receive higher education, rolled out and thrived in the community. So even people who have very serious offenses really benefit from education and, and programming. So it's unfortunate that there are these uh, limits under state law that you refer to, and I was just hoping we could look at them. Uh, absolutely, we can uh, provide that to the commission. Um... Okay, uh, Leo? Yeah, um, in that in that vein, um, um, Assistant Sheriff Aloma, there was some information that we had some time ago, certainly with the prior administration of the sheriff, that there um, were concerns that faith-based chaplains and faith-based volunteers were um, being uh, prohibited or excluded from 
coming into the jail and uh, meeting with various inmates. Um, and, and I know that for many inmates, uh, having that kind of assistance um, was really helpful. Uh, can you talk briefly about the status of that? Sure, no, and I think thank you for bringing that up. You know, faith-based organizations and and uh, individuals coming into our jail to provide those type of religious services to our population are very important. Um, so I, I can tell you that uh, we have through again our Inmate Services Bureau our, our religious services. Uh, anyone coming into our facilities has to be vetted, of course. Um, but once that vetting process is uh, completed, um, we do allow. Um, uh, faith based organizations and uh, from various de uh, denominations to come into our, our facilities. I don't know if the time period you were referring to uh, some of that may have been curtailed due to COVID or if there were other reasons. Um, but certainly I can uh, look into uh, what the current day status is because again, I agree with you that uh, religious uh, uh, and faith based organizations are an important part of. Um, you know, our, our system and services to our population. Um, thank you. I, I don't think it had to do with COVID, although I might be confusing timeframes. I think that there was a sense that um, some um, chaplains and, and individuals uh, from organizations that uh, the prior administration, them gone. Um, Claiming that they may have created disruption or some basically nonsense, but but they are important to have. And um, as long as you know you and the sheriff and the department feels that they they serve a valid purpose, um, certainly once they're vetted, they should be they should continue to assist on a regular basis. No, thank you, for, thank you for that. I, I know that just speaking anecdotally and, and personally, when I was a, a commander over Men's Central Jail and later the division chief, I, I had personal contact with um, uh, religious based organizations that were coming into our our facilities and providing services. Um, I, I can't speak specifically maybe to uh, the incidents that you're referring to, but again, uh, they are allowed and but however, there is a vetting process to ensure that they meet the uh, Qualification standards to, to come into our secured uh, areas of our facilities. JP. Yeah, just quickly, um, I do want to thank the members of the Civil Grant Commission for coming here today, uh, Dr. Griles and uh, Mr. Uh, Anthony Johnson, um, or Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson. Um, and I really appreciate the reports you're doing. I appreciate the fact you're going out to the facilities. I too. Um, have uh, made multiple visits to CRDF. I have made multiple visits to Twin Towers in Mint Central Jail. Um, and I hope my comments, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Clayton Johnson and I, we, uh, we agree, absolutely. We want everyone that can be released from custody to be released from custody. If there's any reason uh, that they, if there's any way they can be not held in custody pending their adjudication, that should absolutely be done. As I think we absolutely agree with that. We want people to get the proper treatment. We're not looking at just shuffling people around just to find beds, but uh, nothing would make me happier than to see Twin Towers cease being the largest mental health facility Practically in the United States, I think it is the largest mental health facility in the United States. It was not designed for that. The men and women working there uh, did not become deputy sheriffs to work in a mental institution. And I know how challenging it is for for the uh, for the men and women in custody there, and or the men in custody in Twin Towers, and the men and women who work at Twin Towers. Everyone is really working very hard. It's a very very difficult environment. Um, so I think we are absolutely uh, in lockstep. We need to figure out a better way to treat our mentally ill than to lock them up. And everyone needs to be treated humanely. And if there's some way yeah, we can reimagine some of these other facilities, though, we should we should definitely we want to add our voice to that because we have got to do a better job. It's just not it's just an 
tolerable situation we're in right now. So, but again, I thank Dr. Griles and uh, Mark Anthony uh, Clayton Johnson for their reports today and their hard work with the Civil Brand Commission. And I look forward to continued working with closely with them. Thank you. So, um, uh, Sheriff Luna uh, is going to weigh in on uh, uh, maybe on this and any other issue. Your first, what is a month in office? I was saying some wonderful things. Unfortunately, I was muted. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm getting an education right now uh, from all of you. Uh, so I, I'm really enjoying listening to this. And then uh, now, uh, uh, Sean, are we, because I'd like to make some comments about the custody stuff. And then uh, I was scheduled to speak to all of you about my first um, uh, five weeks in office. Is, is that okay to do that now or? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, so just uh, in, in regards to our custody facilities, um, again, very frustrating to hear. Um, and uh, I, I know that uh, Mark uh, Anthony was, was asking about my position on Men's Central Jail. And I made that very clear uh, through my campaign and coming through. Um, one of the first custody facilities that I went to go inspect, and I will continuously inspect, is Men's Central Jail. I've actually inspected, I've only been here five weeks, but I've inspected all of our custody facilities uh, with the exception of CRDF. Uh, and I plan on going there as well. And I don't only go there for 10, 15 minutes. I was there for hours uh, talking to employees, talking to inmates, um, and uh, Men's Central Jail is horrible, and it does need to be closed down. Uh, but my position is you can't close that down and not have alternatives. Uh, you just can't. Uh, so for me, uh, in, in everything we're talking about, we need upgraded facilities. Uh, facilities that make it very clear that our priority uh, is uh, health care, mental health care. Uh, for our uh, inmates, uh, rehabilitation, re-entry, uh, reintegration services. Our facilities don't, can't do that right now. Uh, and that's what we need. And then the educational and recreation, when you start finding out that uh, uh, because of some facility limitations that we're not able to give our inmates the opportunity uh, to be involved in recreation, that's not acceptable. Uh, it is not. Uh, that's what drives uses of force and all these other things that um, someday I hope we can eliminate so much of that. But these upgraded facilities, I hope we can work with each and every one of you uh, because I got to be honest with you, I think a lot of the conditions are inhumane. Uh, they absolutely are. Uh, and I've had relatives uh, in the county jail system that I've gone to go visit. Uh, so I look at this as uh, my family members, not only my obligation as your sheriff. So I just I just kind of want to wrap that up and just tell you that's how I, I feel very strong about that. But I'm willing to listen and learn as I learned on this conversation. Uh, that's who I've always been. Uh, so moving on uh, to uh, my first uh, five weeks. Um, uh, and, and I'll start off, and I may have said it earlier, it's an absolute privilege and honor uh, to be here with all of you. Uh, it will not be the last time you see me. Uh, I will be a regular. I wish I could say that I'd be here for every meeting. Uh, I, I don't know if that's possible, but if I'm not here, uh, a high-ranking member of our command staff will always be here uh, and be available to answer any questions that you may have. And if we don't have answers, uh, our job is to go find them. Uh, we will never hide from you. Uh, I believe in oversight. Uh, I've lived and worked through oversight. I'm not afraid of oversight. Uh, my thing is, if I'm doing everything right, I have nothing to hide. And if I'm not doing something right, then uh, it is our job to do it right. And you're going to help me get there. Uh, that's the way I see the partnership. Um, some people don't want it to be a partnership because I guess some people want us at odds, but I, I don't really work that way. Uh, and I'm not offended uh, by you telling me that we're not doing something right. I just wanna make that very clear. Um, 
so I understand the value of it. Uh, and then I, I am seeking a stronger uh, collaborative relationship with each and every one of you. Uh, and it'll be um, maybe speaking to you in this manner or when I see you out, because all of you are very engaged in our community, and so will I be, as I have been. So I'm looking forward to building a stronger relationship. And I, I made it very clear to the members of my command staff and all the members of our department that I'm speaking to and will continue to. Uh, my goal is simple. I want to make this a 21st century sheriff's department, uh, one that looks out towards the future, looks at better ways of doing things. Uh, that is, uh, and, and our key to success is a collaborative partnership with our community. We cannot reduce crime without our community. We cannot impact homelessness without our community. And I've made it very clear to our employees that I expect and will defend good policing, uh, and I will be calling out bad policing wherever it occurs. Uh, that's the way you gain credibility. And at the end of the day, when I talk about community uh, collaboration, uh, number one uh, job of ours is public trust, because that's the part you can't do or be effective at anything else. Just a couple of uh, highlights of things we've done uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Huntsman's on the call. So um, one of the first things I did when I became sheriff uh, is allow him back into the building. Yes, he wasn't allowed in our building. Uh, and uh, why that happened, again, I'm not here to, to cast uh, negative, negative thoughts about my predecessor. I don't believe in looking backwards. I believe in looking forward. But I can tell you that Mr. Huntsman uh, now has access not only to our building, but there was a list of other things that he didn't have access to. And I made sure that he was going to have access to those again. Uh, again, my philosophy is I don't, I don't have anything to hide. Uh, and if he finds something, uh, I have every confidence in his uh, uh, professional expertise that he'll bring it to all of you and all of us. And at the end of the day, we're here to serve the residents of this county, and that's exactly uh, what we're going to do. And things like giving them access to body-worn cameras. Uh, yeah, that's something that wasn't around. And, and I made a mistake at first, and I told people, hey, I want to go back to the way it was. Uh, shame on me, I didn't clarify that. They, they meant, was that under Jim McDonald or was that under Alex Villanueva? So uh, there were some things I had to make corrections for, but that put me on the phone or on a meeting with ALADS uh, really soon after that. But communication and being able to listen and learn makes a huge difference in this world. Uh, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Not gonna agree on everything, uh, but you know what, we can, we can, we can uh, solve a lot of issues if we're sitting down uh, talking. Uh, improving communication with each and every one of you. I've already touched on that. Uh, that is the goal. Um, I look forward to your comments. I look forward to your criticisms. And I look forward at the end of the day to make things uh, better. I've talked to many of you on the phone already uh, with my expectations of our department. And I've had very good comments from each and every one of you. Um, I want you all to know, and I haven't advertised this, that public integrity unit, so-called public integrity unit, does not exist anymore in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, that is a thing of the past. And yeah, we had to, there's a lot of sausage that had to be made. What are you doing? What have you done? Uh, briefings with very high uh, level people here, uh, discussion, uh, with the with George Gascon, the district attorney, uh, and that was a face to face one with him and I. We can sit in a room together and talk like two adults, and uh, we are able to forward any information to him that needs to go that direction, or refer it to the attorney general's office or wherever else it may need to go. Uh, but uh, be assured uh, that unit is in the history of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, transparency efforts, uh, I will do everything we can uh, to guide uh, this department uh, through full transparency. And I know in law enforcement, that doesn't always mean what everyone in the community wants. It has to be within the parameters of the law because there's some information that we will not put out. But at the same time, when we can't, I'll do my best 
or members of this department will do its best to explain why. Uh, well, sometimes we don't explain why very well. I don't want to have that little black box in law enforcement that, you know, we're hiding behind things. We have to just be as honest as we can. Uh, it's already started. Uh, I don't know if most of you are aware, we had an incident in uh, South LA uh, not too long ago, an audio recording that came out and uh, we immediately uh, put out the body worn camera footage. Uh, and that's something we haven't done uh, in the past. And uh, we're gonna get through that. Uh, looking at, for example, deputy involved shootings, there's a lot of uh, body worn camera footage that we haven't put out uh, for one reason or another, and we're playing catch up right now, just following the 1421, the PRA. I wanna make sure that, that we are within the confines of the law and uh, we'll be working with Mr. Huntsman on a lot of those uh, issues. And um, I welcome, you know, comments, not only positive ones, but things that we need to improve on. And if we need to do more uh, to, again, to build uh, that public trust. Um, we expect to release all of our deputy involved videos. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of February, again, we're playing catch up. There's a lot of things when I walked in this office that we were finding out weren't being done for one reason or another. We're trying to correct that. Um, please be patient and give us time, but there's nothing wrong with asking, hey, what are you doing or what are you not doing? I get a lot of people that are already saying, hey, how come you haven't done this yet? Uh, and I have to remind everybody I've been in office for five weeks. I get it. The expectations are high. I was elected to bring change. Uh, not to maintain the status quo here, and that's what I intend to do. But you'll find that I'm kind of a quiet person in doing that, uh, but I will do whatever I can to communicate the best I can and market what uh, we are uh, doing. Um, I also uh, need to let you know that we're talking about body-worn cameras. Uh, I have asked a lot of questions about expanding the program. Uh, I want to, my vision, uh, forecasting out, and yes, it takes money and it takes time, um, that we will have body-worn cameras on, for example, any unit in the Sheriff's Department that serves search warrants, our narcotics teams, uh, major crimes, uh, our SCB, our SWAT people. Uh, they don't currently have them. Uh, we're going to work towards that. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, that is the national standard. And I don't wanna just meet the national standard, I wanna exceed it in a lot of ways, and that's what we're working towards. Uh, so we'll be working uh, with the CEO. And just like I talked to Mr. Huntsman uh, when I first got here, I have had very productive conversations, not only with the county CEO um, and uh, other uh, county partners, including our board of supervisors, and everyone's got a smile on their face and they're looking forward to working with us. And that's, that's critical as I move forward. Um, we are working uh, with the CEO. Um, and again, I don't wanna get ahead of myself because we'll be making public announcements, but hopefully we'll get to you before we get to the public about some restructuring that we're talking about doing. It does take some budget enhancements, uh, but I envision a, a division here uh, that will look at the issue of deputy gangs. And yes, I call them a deputy gang. Uh, I, uh, I find th this issue unacceptable. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is something, this, we shouldn't use deputy gang or click in the same sentence with law enforcement. And I've made it very clear to everybody here that not only is it unacceptable, but everyone in a command level position uh, will be fully engaged uh, with uh, forthcoming whether they're recommendations and working with each and every one of you. Uh, and I look forward to that partnership uh, there. Uh, that uh, this grouping will not only be handling deputy gangs, but our consent decrees that we have. Uh, we have currently three. And uh, my goal is compliance, cooperation, compliance, and ultimately getting this sheriff's department, our county, out of the consent decree business. Uh, but I, that's gonna take a lot of work. And I'm already talking to other police chiefs and sheriffs across the country that are being very, or have been successful. How are you doing it? Uh, because our, we will do that. And we'll also be looking at best practices. Um, and I'll give you an example, and I'm just throwing this out. When you're talking about deputy gangs, 
Uh, I don't think you can do it without a program like ABLE. Uh, uh, and I think most of you are familiar with that program. I'm very familiar coming from Long Beach because I was working on an MOU uh, to work on with the Georgetown University and teaching our employees that when you see misconduct, you have an absolute obligation to report it and our supervisors and how to deal with it. Uh, and that's, you know, um, uh, Commissioner Johnson talked about whistleblowing. That's all part of it. And we, people should be able to come forward and talk about what they're seeing um, and not be afraid of retaliation. And again, that's the vision. That's 21st century policing, as I call it. And that's the vision of what we're, we're doing. Um, looking at court orders, technology issues, some of the things all of you brought up uh, related to custody, uh, uh, grievances, uh, a paper trail. I, I mean, in this day and age, uh, there are so many members of this department that are still writing things out in paper. Uh, it, it's, it's insane. So part of our budget strategy uh, is to uh, get into that 21st century to upgrade our CAD and RMS systems, our radio systems, and the way we communicate so we can better provide information, uh, not only to all of you, but at, uh, at the end of the day, our community. Uh, and all this takes money, and, and I wanna throw this in there, that uh, this department manages a $3.8 billion budget. Um, most businesses or corporations don't have that much budget to uh, to manage. Uh, one of the first things I did, amongst many other things, is I hired back a CFO, uh, a professional budgeting person who understands the planning of budgets, uh, how to not only plan and prepare them, but how to present them. So we're not sitting there pointing fingers at board of supervisors that you know they're not they're they're shortcutting us on money. I have an obligation to all of you, all of our community members, to put forth uh, a good, solid budget plan with priorities that come from the community. So that is, again, just a synopsis of things that we've been doing uh, in five weeks. So there's there's a lot going on, and I'm very proud of the work that uh, we're, this team uh, is doing moving forward uh, together. Uh, looking at crime, that's a top priority for us, too. But again, uh, my crime fight, fighting strategy is going to be a strategy that's gonna be driven by data, uh, not rhetoric. Uh, we're gonna look at facts, we're gonna work with partners, we're gonna work with our community, and that strategy will incorporate all those uh, aspects of it, including um, uh, input or work from our community with prevention and intervention. Uh, I want to be very proud and I want to be a department that everyone comes to to look at. Well, how did you guys do this? Well, this is the way we did it, but we've got to start somewhere. And 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 this is where we're at. And again, it's not the blame game uh, anymore. Uh, it's it's us looking in the mirror and taking accountability and owning it. Um, but again, working uh, with all of you. Uh, so uh, please know that uh, as, as one of you mentioned earlier, uh, I, I, I've talked about integrity. I am talking about integrity. I'm talking about accountability and I am talking about collaboration. And that's gonna be fundamental to everything uh, that we do. And the way uh, that these me uh, the members of our command staff and every member of this department will conduct themselves uh, moving forward. And yes, uh, we have to hold people accountable and, and we will. But I, like I tell everybody, it starts with me. I have to hold myself accountable for my conduct, the way I talk to the public, the way I talk to the media, the way I talk to each and every one of you, including uh, the inspector general, each of the board of supervisors. I expect, tell my employees, I want you to treat people the way you want your family members treated. Uh, and it starts with me. Uh, so uh, we'll do that. So much work to do. I know I don't have that much time, uh, I have a whole list of things that we've done uh, in detail, uh, but you know what? I'm going to pause there and, and open it up to any questions that you may have. Uh, but I do, I, I want to sincerely thank you uh, for your service. Uh, and I really respect the work that you do and that you're going to do. Uh, and you're going to make this department better. And it's going to be a collective, a collective effort. So thank you. Thank you. Uh... 
Sheriff Luna, I really appreciate your remarks. Um, Tracy is reminding me of the time that we need to uh, uh, have uh, uh, the recommendations uh, before us. And um, Tracy, you said we have to take public comments. We actually took public comments before. Do we have to take them again? Yes. Public comment on the conditions of confinement item. Okay. All right. So, what uh, you want to read the the recommendations or? The recommendations are in the report that has been attached to the agenda. Okay, so we can just take the public comment then. Okay, we will go ahead so, and. Um, I think yes, uh, yes. Sorry, I, I think also um, the public um, is entitled to comment on um, any of the, the statements from Sheriff Luna, which were certainly welcome. Um, but I think the public can comment on that as well. Uh, okay, it's 241. So uh, we may have to, uh, depending on the number of people, we may have to uh, shorten it, which I hate to do. Uh, Jennifer, do you know how many people we're talking about? Right now, we're only looking at two individuals with their hand raised. And let's give them the full two minutes. Okay. Um, Pastor, Q, Pastor Q, please. Pastor Q, you've been sent. Um, Good morning to all. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, and happy new year. Um, I would just like to say that um, I want to commend uh, the uh, COC for this struggle and this fight. I remember when the previous sheriff said to us that he does not answer to us. I think he was gravely mistaken. 72% of the voters said yes to measure A. So the stuff that we're talking about today, if 72% of the voters said yes to measure A, uh, to remove a sheriff for cause, I think this was on people's heart. Uh, measure A got more vote than the governor of California. So I think it was, uh, I wanna commend this commission for actually not running from that issue and actually um, heading into the storm and some of you guys uh, experience what we experience every day, right? Um, Dr. King said uh, that we have greatly strengthened the forces of reaction in America and excited violence and hatred among our people. We have diverted attention from civil rights during a period of war when a nation becomes obsessed with guns, with the guns of war, social programs inevitably, inevitably suffer. And that's exactly what's happening in our jails. We have put so much resources into war, into a war on crime. We treat our people as if they are the enemy. Um, and so because of that, that's why we don't have proper nutrition for folks. It's really reflective uh, of our hearts, right? And so the scripture says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so um, I, implore you to continue to press on um, and, and to do the work. Blessings. Thank you. And next we will hear from Vanessa Perez. Vanessa, you've been sent the request to unmute. Okay, please go ahead, Vanessa. Okay. Um, my name is Vanessa Perez and I'd like to share some of my son's experience um, with your Los Angeles County Sheriff's on the streets and in the jail. Um, first, they're in proper medical attention, um, not having access, access to a psych while in jail, and then um, lack of being properly prescribed the correct medication. Then we just seen my son mentally ill, um, human being to a house full of parolees who are not capable of handling a person with special needs and expect him to succeed is mind boggling. My son is currently now in a psychiatric ward in a hospital being he tried to hurt himself with Google. Um, don't get me wrong, I think a house full of parolees changing their lives is a wonderful thing, but when you throw a person suffering with mental health needs, it spins things around for everyone included. After being severely beat to the point of needing to be resuscitated, 
only to be given a Tylenol and put in a county jail for two years with the jail violence abuse from the deputies. Um, being put in that MOH or HOA for two weeks with no showers, no phones, getting served with water with black specks in it, and his food train being thrown in his cell. Um, and then I finally get a visit, and he shares these horrible conditions, which I reported to the OIG. In return, my son gets outside time, outside time all day in the cage on the roof. His was not long ago in 2022. Um, next, I'd like to touch on the deputy, um, Paul Sedano on the Dallas High School campus where my daughter attends. Reminder, Deputy Paul Sedano beat her brother, my son, who I mentioned above or earlier. Um, he beat my son until he stopped moving. How much longer does my daughter have to go to school seeing that deputy that attempted to kill her brother on the school campus? Not only has this system failed one of my children, but two of them. I ask you to imagine if they were your children, what would you do? I kindly ask the respect of the new sheriff, Luna, to please reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And we have sent a request to Tiffany Tavares for you to unmute Tiffany. It looks like we're not getting a response there. Adriana Quinones, you've been sent the request. Please go ahead, Adriana. Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Quinones, resident of Hacienda Heights and community advocate. Um, we'd like to make a comment uh, for Sheriff Luna. Sheriff Luna, I'm very involved with my community in different levels, and I work very closely with law enforcement. I can tell you that the industry sheriff station is outstanding. You have a deputy Ruano who interacts with the community, who is always making sure that our concerns are addressed. So I would like to see that you follow the example that he has provided uh, to the rest of the uh, stations. He is an outstanding, he's the best um, law enforcement officer I have ever worked with. And I worked with LAPD before. Uh, so please make a note of that. Uh, secondly, I would like to see you um, have town hall meetings with every community, uh, starting with our community of Hacienda Heights. Um, we definitely want to hear your proposals and provide you with feedback and suggestions. Also be aware that um, there's a fine line. Um, when do you prioritize uh, criminals uh, before the public? It's a fine line. I believe in uh, treating people fairly, but also holding them accountable. Um, I grew up in Royal Heights where there was a lot of crime. And uh, I would like to see that us, the public, gets protected from that. Um, you know, uh, it, it is not fair to live in fear uh, because uh, someone may be, you know, uh, maybe thinking that they're not treating, being treated properly. I think that we have to go back to accountability in every level, starting with us, the community. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. And Chair Kennedy, we do have four individuals left for a public comment. Would you like to reduce time to one minute or stay with two minutes per person? Uh, well, if that's it, we'll do the, we'll let people have their two minutes. Okay, please go ahead, Tiffany. Good afternoon. The first thing I want to say is thank you. I've been um, attending this commission uh, by the computer for quite some time, and this is the first time I see it functioning as an actual group. Um, the fact that um, Mr. Luna has shown up to be part of this process is um, creates a lot of hope. I am one of the mothers who has buried a child as a result of police violence. And I've cried in front of many um, different councils and groups and you know advocacy groups or anywhere I could to get the notice out. But this is the first time I feel like I, I wanna cry in hope that there's hope that there's a group. We don't have this in Orange County, but I hope that at some point people can start to understand that the violation of civil rights of anybody, not, even if they are supposedly criminals or in the justice system or 
how that the millions of people that are in our systems right now, how important it is that the systems around the police departments do what they're supposed to do for accountability and for transparency. Nothing good grows well in the dark. And I just want to say thank you. I know I can. I feel over emotional because this is so close to what us mothers want to hear that things can change and things can get better. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. And next we have Jeanette Asante. Jeanette, you've been sent the request to unmute. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Janet Asante and I am with the Justice LA Coalition. Um, I just like to say a few things based on on what I've heard today. I think, um, you know, a lot of great things have been said from some of the presentations, but I think the primary thing is is diversion. And Luna, I know you yourself said that, you know, you know that the conditions are bad, you know that people need care. Um, and in order to close men's central jail, we need alternatives. And those alternatives have already been outlined in a number of reports, the men's central jail closure report, the alternatives to incarceration work group report. Um, so if we're able to simply implement the resources that countless experts and consultants and work groups have, you know, spent innumerable hours putting together um, and implementing the care that our community needs, because, you know, as much as some people like to say that criminals are outside of our community, that is crime represents a failure of our state to take care of our community. And so the more that we implement these resources and the more that we implement these alternatives to incarceration and healthcare, the less crime that we're going to see time and time again, that has been proven. So I really wanna highlight and stress the prioritization of diversion of care um, and truly a care first approach. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Will Brown. Will, a request has been sent. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Hi, yes, I'm Will Brown. I wanted to welcome uh, Sheriff Luna to the Los Angeles community and this wonderful commission. Um, you know, our community in Los Angeles has had some wonderful law enforcement leaders that have accomplished a major change. And certainly we all hope that you will walk that path and be able to affect a major change uh, in a system that is huge and very challenging. Um, on the issue of deputy gangs, um, as you know, Sheriff, there are a lot of reports that already exist that lay out the history of deputy gangs, the Rand report, the Loyola Law School report. Um, and it's a, an issue that's been intransigent and it's a, a deeply seated cultural issue. I'm wondering if uh, you can or, or have designated a point person in the sheriff's department to receive uh, suggestions or comments uh, from the public on addressing deputy gangs. Some of us in the public have experience with uh, organizational cultural change and what it takes to get cultural change to happen. And uh, my experience with that is that the deputy gang issue is a deep cultural change issue and it will take time and sustained effort. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a person that uh, could be the point person for those of us in the community to contact on the issue of deputy gangs. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And next, we will hear from Stephanie Luna. A request has been sent, Stephanie, for you to be unmuted. Please go ahead. For Luna, um, this is the family of Anthony Vargas. Just letting you know that we have our eyes on you, Robert. Uh, don't think because you showed up here today that your job is done. The campaign that you ran on was very similar to the same campaign that Alex Villanueva ran on the county of Los Angeles is watching you and waiting for you to make the necessary changes that you campaigned for and the changes that you promised for. And the county is ready uh, to hold you accountable, the community, the impacted families and the, the residents. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And Michelle, um, I have sent a request for you to unmute if you can acknowledge the request to unmute. 
you're unmuted. Please go ahead, Michelle. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle. Infante and with Dignity and Power Now. Last year in January uh, 2022, the commission promised and pledged that there would be more discussion on the issues pertaining to women um, at the facility, uh, Century Regional Detention Facility. They definitely have deputy gangs. There are definitely sexual assaults by deputies, and the deputies are still inside and haven't been accountable for any of that stuff. Pregnant women having an unnatural amount of miscarriages um, from stress and uh, lack of proper prenatal care um, and possibly from alleged sexual assault, Me medical neglect. We have a girl, uh, Ruby Beltran, who should have been having chemotherapy from the time that she started inside in her incarceration in June, and she had zero until she was released. She had absolutely no care. Also, they were given wrong medications. Complaint process. People were complaining, and they were going in the trash, they were only allowed two complaints. That complaint process needs to change in every aspect of, of how you're taking a complaint. Um, you had an overabundance of C-sections. Um, the, the department didn't even tell the truth when the female died on December the 19th. This is what happened to her. She'd been complaining for weeks and weeks, never got any medical care. The day she was on the phone, cause she, she asked for medical care to a sheriff. And instead, the following morning, for eight hours, she laid on her face, and deputies bypassed her. They finally figured out she was dead. They dragged her by her feet out to the front, left her there, and no CPR or any type of resuscitation was started. So don't think that you're going to get away with any of that stuff anymore. People need to hear when someone dies inside what they're dying from. The narrative is being put out there, and the narrative isn't true. People are dying because of what's happening inside, because of neglect, not because they have hypertension. Thank you, Michelle, and that does conclude your time. Um, and the last person we will hear from is Lou Walker. Lou, please go ahead. Um, hi, Lori Walker, NAACP president from the Antelope Valley. Um, I've been, I'm new, about two weeks so far, and there's been so many issues in the animal belly that have been ignored. And I have personally walked into the sheriff stations and witnessed a lot of minority residents not even being allowed to file complaints. I met two black women under the age of 25 who were um, strip searched while pregnant, while in um, LA County Sheriff custody. I've met families whose children have been taken by the sheriff's department and put into DCFS custody. They were not given a receipt, no documentation. Um, and as I continue to investigate those matters, it's, there's more and more cases that are stemming from um, negative encounters with the sheriff's department. What I'm aiming to do is educate the community on how to handle these matters in court and to focus on officer bonding. Um, if anyone listening here would love to reach out to Antelope Valley, we are definitely um, working together to improve education um, and to be more effective. Um, so it's a really good opportunity um, for me to be in here. It's my first time coming to this meeting. And if I'm not available, I'm gonna push for the community or for someone from our organization to um, show up, listen, and at least report back to us to see how these meetings move forward and how productive they are. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Chair Kennedy, that does conclude all of the public comments. Uh, thank you so much. We actually made it. Um, my question is, do we need to vote on anything regarding this last report or is it just a discussion? Hearing nothing from Tracy. Uh, yeah, it was just, just a discussion, Chair. Okay, so I think uh, we are ready to adjourn right at 1 o'clock and um, our next regularly scheduled meeting is Thursday, February 16th. Uh, we may have a meeting in between then, depending on uh, the status of um, the ad hoc committees on deputy cliques or gangs. I want to thank the sheriff and his uh, leadership team for coming here to engage with us and the public about all these topics. Sheriff Luna, you can hear the stress and anxiety of a lot of community members regarding deputy gangs and the situation in the jail. Um, and we appreciate that you 
uh, stayed and listened to members of the public and uh, engaged with us. So thank you. I also want to thank our team regarding uh, uh, the street races for reporting on that issue and our colleagues from Sybil Brand who always provide us so much um, information about the struggles in the jail. So uh, Brian, unless there's anything else, I think uh, we can say goodbye and we'll see everyone on February 16th. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good month. Thanks. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff.